All right, now that all the good times are over, we're back to uh, the world as it is, a mess. And uh, help us sort through all this, in fact, even add some more cr trouble to it, <laughs> is Larry. He is not the cable guy, folks. He is Larry the contractor guy. There's a difference. <laughs> yeah. the, the cable guy's better looking. <laughs> That's not nice, but hey, you know, we well, both wear ball caps. I, I, I drive a pickup. I assume he does, too. Yeah. That makes three of us. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so... Uh, we have uh, much to do and uh, probably never enough time to do it in. But uh, as you go through this continuum, uh, you were thinking about just taking, what, a little uh, side street here to address yeah, what might have been going just on? Just very briefly, uh, you know, uh, you sent me an email um, I, uh, about, uh, you know, the, the coming conflict. And uh, there was a, a couple of uh, attachments, PDFs, uh, from a uh, an army officer, Major Ralph Peters, yep. who is in intelligence, um, apparently has a master's degree in international relations. He, he's a heck of and, a writer, uh, isn't he? I mean, what's that? He's a heck of a writer. He's a good writer. He really is. But I really, really strongly disagree with his conclusion. I know. I know. But and uh, you know, and I, the reason I brought it up is this guy represents the kind of smug arrogance. The, the almost imperialistic, I well, should say, imperialistic outlook of uh, certain elements of our military and our power structure in the United States. And the reason I brought it up is it reminds me a, a great deal of the way that uh, Hitler and the, uh, the German army uh, just kind of looked down on the rest of the European powers, and in particular, the, the power that really kicked them in the butt, and that's the uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which is now gone back to being called being called Russia. All right, let me hold on a second. A uh, couple of things, real quick, just so people yeah. can get caught up to speed. One, those two PDFs to which you meant uh, to which you address your comments. Right. I'll put up with the link. Right. Um, also, you got something that was sent from Liam real recently. I don't know if you got that before you left work Friday talking about how everybody arms everybody else before they go in and fight them. Yeah. Did, did you yeah. see that one at all, Larry? <clears throat> no, I don't think I did right. this. I don't remember seeing that. Okay, and I didn't send it to you because either you got it on Friday and then you weren't going to see it until Monday, so I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't get it to you. Yeah, uh, no problem. But it's the same thing. Check it out. And also, I would like to say to folks, too, if you've not read the PDF that I saved, and that is the Unholy Alliance, this has got nothing to do with Lavenda. It's got to do with, at that time, recently released, previously before, <laughs> uh top secret, whatever you want to call it, documents that revealed that DuPont and General Motors and Ford all helped the German war machine prior to World War II. So oh, I'm going to put that, and I'm going to uh, put that in. all the vehicles that the German army drove it. were right. made by General Motors and Ford. Um, the other thing I want folks to realize, too, is that um, Larry's addressing his comments to something that was sent around by Jeff Long, who when, when Jeff Long sends stuff around, I pay attention. I think I think you I do, do too. too. Yeah. Uh, Jeff uh, was apparently, uh, from what I understand on the show, is a former intelligence operative himself, I uh, believe in the Air Force. And uh, when he sees something of this nature coming from intelligence, uh, you know, apparently it caught his eye. Yeah, and, and it's kind of giving us an idea of what the, the, at least the Army is thinking, the Army intelligence is thinking. What, what, what I like about Jeff is, is that, you know, he was there, he was happy for the time, he served and such. Mm -hmm. uh, he stays somewhat in their vision because every so often he gets job descriptions sent by him, and that's why this is so rich in that mm -hmm. Jeff told us over a year ago that the United States military had a presence enough in Somalia, specifically in the Horn of Africa, that they were now going uh, ahead and posting jobs for civilians. And he got one of them. He gets them all the time. And that's when he said, can you believe it, that they are now so entrenched that they feel safe enough to bring over cities and everyone else uh, for all the other things that have to take place. What I liked about that RT.com article, and I'll put that link up too, Larry, sure. and, and that is unlike some of these other sites who, who say they've got it together, like globalrepuke.ca, <laughs> those guys were hip to the fact that, yes, we're in Somalia and yeah. a whole lot of other places, and, and, I, and that's the genesis, I guess, for where you're going to go with this. But I'm going to ask you one question. To bring it down to a true analogy, a level analogy, mm -hmm. the, and, and you used the word imperial, and I think you were uh, um, imperialism, but I think you were going for two other things also, an imperial attitude and an imperious attitude, like we ain't going to get a scratch on us. But let me ask you this. The mindset of Peters, 
Right. Would you now? You can't equate it with Hitler because Hitler would be like Obama. Oh, no. You know no, what I mean? Uh, I, Who I would you take? And I don't. I don't think Peters is a. You know, definitely. I, I doubt seriously he's a fascist. You know, <laughs> uh, he talks a lot about democracy in here and about you know how great American democracy and freedom are. And blah blah blah. But let me but ask the you. The fact is, the fact is, he's serving a war machine, which is, you know. Uh, attempting to impose the American will, you know, a pox Americana, if right. you will, across the world. And something that bothers me about it is the last paragraph, he says, the next century will indeed be American, but it will also be troubled. He wrote this in 97. We will find ourselves in constant conflict, most, much of it violent. The United States Army is going to add a lot of battle streamers to its flag. Oh, really? We will wage information warfare, but we will fight with infantry, and we will always surprise those critics, domestic and foreign, who predict our decline. That is a, that is, the Bible says that uh, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And all I can say is, you know, if you're counting on uh, the American uh, culture, which has a, a, a great knowledge of uh, digital technology and is able to use digital technology, and we're ahead of the world in information technology, which is what he's saying over and over again in this article. If you're relying on that, uh, it really it, you really have to be a little bit blind to the fact that we're running around over in Eurasia, and we are poking at the Russian bear, and we are also messing with the Chinese dragon. And sooner or later, those two countries, which have high-tech weaponry, are going to get to the point where they are going to fight back. We're going to, uh, in my opinion, we're going to keep pushing them until uh, we find ourselves in a in a war against people that are advanced technologically. Maybe not as advanced technologically as the United States, but how advanced do you have to be? The Russians already have ICBMs, and the Chinese have at least um, uh, mid-range nuclear nuclear missiles. I mean, you know, they they can arm their missiles with nuclear chemical and biological warheads and give us an awful lot of problems. And right. and this just seems to me to be, you know, saying, uh, here's what he says about culture, and it's kind of, you know, here's American culture is so superior. Culture is faith. Countries, clans, military services, and individual soldiers are products of their respective cultures, and they are either empowered or imprisoned. The majority of the world's inhabitants are prisoners of their cultures, and they will rage against inadequacies they cannot admit, cannot bear, and cannot escape. The current chest thumping of some Asian leaders about the degeneracy, weakness, and vulnerability of American culture is reminiscent of nothing so much as of the ranting of the Japanese militarists on the eve of the Pacific War. I do not suggest that any of these Asian leaders intend to attack us, only that they are wrong. Liberty always looks like weakness to those who fear it. You know, that it sounds really nice, but... Uh, we're not dealing with, with uh, we're not dealing with people and cultures and nations in, in the form of, of the Soviet uh, excuse me Soviet Union, the Russians and the Chinese. Th these are two two cultures that uh, have developed high tech weaponry and can really cause a great deal of harm to us. And I think we are going to make the same mistake. Uh, the Russians uh, really had a big surprise for for the Nazis when uh, when when they were uh, pushing trying to get into Moscow uh, and they were being uh, more or less stymied by the weather and then the the Russians attacked they brought in their Siberian troops very tough well trained troops and they had the T34 tank which was the best tank in 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 World War II it was a well engineered tank that was faster more maneuverable better armed and and, and uh, had a better cannon than, than the tanks that the Nazis had in their Panzers. And they got a big surprise there, and they got their butts kicked uh, quite a few miles away from, uh, they, they were pushed quite a few miles back away from Moscow by these troops and by those tanks. Uh, you're not dealing with people there who are pushovers. And, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say that the American military isn't powerful. It is. But uh, if we keep running around the world, and keep pushing things the way that we are, uh, we we may very well meet the same fate that the Nazis did. All right, now hold on, because, again, you piled up a bunch of things I want to ask you about, okay? Sure, sure. How dare you speak seven minutes straight on my show? 
What do you think? This is your audio? <laughs> uh, no. I mean, don't Collins Brothers me, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Don't bogart this show, bro. Hey, man, I didn't say anything about amenitizing the eschaton. Yeah, okay, well, what is it? Uh, what was it? Oh, I, I, I don't really know I what know, that I means, don't know, but, I you know. know, I like the way it sounds. Or a Sturmendang, and I don't know, anyway. <laughs> um, first, I want to bring you back to one thing, and that is sure. equate Peters to yeah. somebody else in the Nazi hierarchy who would run his mouth about and be so uh, in, imperious about their force. Well, are we looking at maybe uh, Goebbels or... I think Goebbels did it. Goering did it. Uh, Hitler, of course, himself did it. Uh, Hitler said at one point uh, that they really, he was trying to get across to, to the German people and to his, his officers. He said that uh, the, uh, the Russians, ba that Russia was basically a, a, uh, uh, a dilapidated house or something to that effect. He says all you have to do is just kick the door in and the whole rotten edifice will fall down upon itself. You know, he he uh, he was so arrogant and, and so dismissive of, of of the Slavic people in general, and especially the Russians, that they went ahead and attacked at the wrong time of year, and they did not equip their troops with with winter clothing, and they did not equip their vehicles with the correct type of uh, uh, lubricants. You know, they were using oil that uh, that you know was got just a little too thick, thick in the winter time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, they they put themselves in a position to get their butts kicked when the when the Russian winter came. First came the mud from the uh, the rains in, in the late in uh, in the fall, and then then the Russian winter kicked in, and they were just basically immobile. The Russians didn't have any problems. They knew how to deal with it. They knew how to dress for it. They knew how to fight in that kind of weather, and they had the right kind of vehicles with the right kind of. Uh, Engines and lubricants, you but, know. But the reason I bring this up is because, and why, why I said to you, um, it would not be apples and apples if you uh, correlated Peter's mindset with that of Hitler, because Hitler obviously was the chancellor. I mean, we'd have to look at him and the president of the United right. States. However, okay, but be that as it may, and here's another interesting thing, too. The reason why I look at some of these individuals who, ha who came to uh, some kind of primacy Mm -hmm. And don't you find it interesting that usually they are in the military or equate themselves with the military? So when they come up to the top, the military, which in the United States usually looks, and rightfully so, is all presidents as you ain't shit, right? Mm -hmm. There, he's one of your own. Mm -hmm. However, I'm thinking, I don't know about, you know, his, well, what do you want to call the guys? I mean, like uh, Goebbels, Himmler, and all those other guys. You want to call it his cabinet? I don't know. Uh, the insider's fine. But I think Hitler was used deliberately and knew that he was going to trash the German army in Russia, just like Napoleon got the orders from the dark side to go ahead and try to, like, you know, duke out with Russians again in the wintertime. Are you nuts? So here's what I'm asking you. I watched, actually, a, a couple of years ago, Larry, I watched a, um, like a military history thing about, you know, big goofs in wars. And one of the things was Hitler's. First of all, why are we doing this in the fall? Because guess what's coming real soon? You know? Yeah, exactly. And secondly, they also claimed that Hitler had no exit strategy if the worst happened. Therefore, everybody got abandoned, much like Napoleon abandoned the Grand Army. But what I mean is Hitler and Napoleon and heads of state are in the know. The others aren't. And, and uh, what I mean is there had to be a time when finally – and I think there's a movie out just now, or, or for a while, it's been out, Valkyrie, and where you see some kind of a dramatization of the coup against Hitler, those guys had to know that the, the fix was in. So what yeah. I mean is take the military separate from the guy who's going to go ahead and become a traitor, which would be Hitler, which would have been Napoleon, which would be any of our presidents. And my point is this didn't happen by accident. And, and if you look at it, too, I'm sure, and you're going to tell me that those warriors, like Peters is, warriors are about making war. That's mm -hmm. what they do. They're not happy when there's no war, just like guys who run taxi cabs ain't happy unless they're out there yeah, making exactly. some money. You I don't mean, want to sit around for You can't for a, make rank. You, you can't you move can't do up anything. in the military unless there is a war, generally. So, what I, and I'm going to ask you this. What is your opinion about Peters in this sense. I look at him as, if you got to go to war, you want this junkyard dog on your side. You right. tell me. Well, if you want to go to war, you want an intelligent uh, 
you know, very uh, deep thinking person on your side helping you with your strategy. And uh, you want somebody in intelligence like Peters. My problem with it is, is uh, building this elaborate uh, structure in your mind where American culture is just going to overwhelm the rest of the world. There's some validity to it. American culture is a powerful force in the world. But, you know, it's not like our enemies or those who are potential enemies uh, don't have the ability to inflict a great deal of harm on the United States. And I think sometimes, uh, if you'll forgive the, the, the phrase, we're kind of whistling past the graveyard and, all, and literally yeah, whistling I past it. I agree. Um, but when I look at Peters, I mean, I, I look at somebody, I, I'm, I find his writing enticing because he, he's a good writer, he's obviously very intelligent, and you can tell when he starts writing, you know, it reminds me of, uh, and I hate to trivialize this, if you ever saw Chuck Bednarik in any interviews with NFL films, you know how Chuck <laughs> would like get it. Th- same thing I did with Johnny Unitas. <laughs> well, you know, they would start off calm. And he would get into it, and by the time it was over, they were almost out of their chair wanting to beat up somebody because they're psyched. Yeah, when I, pumped when, up, yeah. So yeah. when I read Peters, I can see Peters, like, lifting out of his chair as he's writing this, like, come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, other yeah, you've got to have that attitude. You can't, uh, you can't be namby-pamby about things. You have to really believe in your cause and, and what you're doing because you're, you're talking about putting people in harm's way, very much literally in harm's way. And you're talking about, you know, uh, the idea that there is kill or be killed, and uh, so you have to be somewhat pumped up. You know, you, you can't be sitting around just, you know, well, gosh, I don't know if we can do it or not. You know, and it's a, it's a tough position to be in. But I think what I see here, and this is just my opinion, but what I see here is a, a bit of unreality slipping in there. You know, yeah, we are going to have conflicts, no doubt, but, I mean, when we're pushing things, when when we have all the, I mean, uh, I was looking at that uh, chart of all the, the uh, military bases that the United States has all over the world, including a ton of them in Germany and Japan, our former enemies, that we, you know, we dispatched them over 65 years ago, what is it, 67 years ago, and yet we still have military bases there. You know, it's, I mean, we're all over the world. We're like, we're, we are an empire. I mean, we have yeah, our we military yep. all yep. over the world. It, and, uh, I mean, just sooner or later, uh, one thing that bothers me is where are we going to find the troops? You know, we're being stretched very thin, which is the same thing that happened to the Third Reich. They were having to fight a war on two fronts. They were stretched too thin. They simply couldn't do it. Napoleon couldn't do it, and Hitler couldn't do it either. All right, then let me ask you this question, though. Now, we're going to run with what you've said. Yeah. And here's now considering if that is the objective, shall we say? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, how do we go about this? What I want to what I want to ask you is, if we're going to get into a duke out on the Eurasian continent, which mm-hmm. I believe and I think you believe fully we are. Yes. The thing is, what is what is the objective? In other words, are we going to occupy? Are we just going to kick ass, take names, and say don't do that again and go back? What, so and you know and it's always been said and it's the tr- it's been true since you know bef- before the common era mm-hmm. that if you want to occupy you got to have you have to have boots on the ground exactly i look at what peters wrote and i think you divine the same thing i mean i think he's made it very clear that when he talks about a mobile agile more effective and lighter force that they're going to do a lot more via drones which is what that rt.com article was bringing to the fore my point is, you you didn't win with Vietnam, dropping as much ordnance as you possibly could drop on those people. It did not work. Right. So what is the idea when you get into the final Fandango on the Eurasian continent? Do you want to occupy, or do you just want to keep the bad guys away? What is the objective? Because if you don't put boots on the ground, all you're going to do is bring hell from above, and that usually doesn't work no matter who you're bombing. Well, we're in a really bad position because we don't have enough boots. We don't, or at least we don't have enough people to occupy those boots, or at least not in our current state. But do you think Peters is saying we don't need them necessarily? Is he I hinting? I think in a way he is. Okay. Yeah, I think in a way he is, and, and that doesn't make sense to me. Um, uh, uh, you know, one thing that, that's come up in the news lately is something I've talked about on this show before, is uh, 
you know, the, the Iranians are, are sitting right there on the, uh, on the east bank of the, uh, of the Persian Gulf uh, and the, on the Straits of Hormuz, and they're sitting there with tons of missile batteries and thousands of missiles that they can rain down on anybody coming through the Straits of Hormuz. This is not an empty threat. And these people, uh, to start with, I think there's an attitude among Americans or a lot of Americans that people in the Muslim or Islamic world, I should say, uh, are basically low-tech, uh, you know, maybe even maybe even some people consider them to be people of lower intelligence. Well, uh, that's really not true. You know, they, they are not as advanced technologically as we are, but... They they know how to uh, they know how to use the money that they get from their uh, from their oil revenues and the uh, the Iranians a long time ago started buying uh, uh, anti ship missiles from the Russians and the Chinese. The Russians have an anti ship missile called the uh, I forget how to pronounce it in Russian, but it's called a sunburn missile. It is the most advanced, uh, according to what I've read in in a couple of uh, sources. It is the most advanced anti-ship missile in the world, and the United States Navy really doesn't have an effective uh, means of, of knocking that thing down. That missile could take out an American uh, aircraft carrier, or, or certainly with several of those being fired, they could take out American aircraft carrier. They could take out a, probably the majority uh, of, a, uh, of a task force with those. They don't have to really do that uh, to start a real problem in the Persian Gulf. All they have to do is uh, fire a few of them at a at an oil tanker, and they will stop the flow of oil from that area of the Persian Gulf, which is about 20% of the oil in the world coming through there, could create a big problem. All they'd have to do is sink a tanker there. There's an area, uh, the, the Straits of Hormuz is about 30-some-odd miles wide, I think, maybe 37 miles wide, relatively narrow uh, entranceway. <clears throat> the area of the Straits of Hormuz where the, where the oil traffic goes through is about two miles. Uh, there's like a channel-type situation where it's deep enough for them to go through, and it's about two miles wide going in and about two miles wide going out. So you've got an area there of about four miles. If you can effectively block up that area going in and going out, uh, you can raise a whole lot of hell. Now, of course, the United States could, you know, just using its its uh, uh, nuclear submarines, you know, its attack submarines could, uh, not attack submarines, but the boomers, they could blast, you know, Iran off the map if they wanted to, and Iran's aware of that. They could also, using conventional uh, weapons, you know, uh, blow the, the daylights out, out of those missile batteries. But Anyway, you look at it. If they decide, if they if they feel threatened enough to want to start something there in the Persian Gulf, they can do it. They have the technology to do that, and it doesn't matter about their culture and how, uh, you know how how much they lack in freedom and American culture. You know, we'll send them a bunch of Rambo videos, blah blah blah. You know, I mean, it really doesn't matter because at that point in time, we we will be screwed blue and tattooed because our uh, you know our economy is going to go into a tailspin I mean and gasoline that costs you know 350 or whatever a gallon uh, right now will go up to several dollars more per gallon uh, within a week and uh, that's going to cause an awful lot of chaos if that takes place and we recently had a um, a uh, one of the ministers of the uh, Iranian government uh, making noise about how they would not allow another, or, or that they would, they're warning us not to send another uh, carrier into the Persian Gulf. Well, we will be sending another carrier into the Persian Gulf, and so it may it may get down to that. Um, again, I, my, all right. You know, I I, I had relationships. Um, when I was in school and when I was at Fairleigh Dickinson, uh -huh. uh, one uh, Iranian became a, a friend of mine right. uh, and got deported <laughs> when he was trying to get into medical yeah, school. Yeah, you told me that story. Yeah, I mean, if anybody yeah. needed, should have been here, it was, it was Abbas Kalani, and he, he's gone. Yeah. 
Right. Uh, his brother was a big. His brother was the Pele of Iranian soccer. Right. Um, we never. We did not know what happened to him because his family were were Shah backers, mm-hmm. and of course oh. when uh, Khomeini did his thing, we figured that they were, they were all be dead. Uh, thankfully, right. he had a cousin in Jackson, New Jersey, who told us that in fact the boss is okay, and the and the trade off was. He wanted to go to medical school. He had to work in a mass unit <coughs> during the Iranian uh, Iraqi, Iraqi war, war yeah. and the last we know that, that he's okay. Now, what I'm saying is, is this. Whenever I look at everybody getting crazy in Iran, it's like that's what they choose to show you. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking that most Iranians who are anywhere near cosmopolitan uh, really don't want any of this. No, I think they don't. From, from everything I've seen and what I understand, uh, even – I've even talked to somebody, you know, who uh, is Iranian. He's an American citizen now, but he was saying his relatives and people that he knows over there, uh, they don't want to fight the United States or anybody else for that matter. They just want a decent life like everybody else. Right. You know, and and the religious fanatics and the uh, in in Akma Dina Jod, you know, whatever. (laughs) Oh, oh my day job. job. Okay. You know, they, they don't back that stuff, but there's nothing they can do about it. They, run, You know, it's a dictatorship, and there's not a lot they can do. But you know, you know that getting they, out in the street didn't work, you know. But you know that they that he's on he's in on the plan, too, just like Hitler was. Right, My right. point is that he goes out, he makes comments, he, he quote, supposedly inflames all these Americans, mm-hmm. and that's his job. I had to laugh about it. Anybody who wears, like, like that 1950s, <laughs> like, zip-up, you know, car jacket. Yeah, a Nehru jacket, yeah. Yeah, well, and he, and he comes in, he says a couple of things, and, and everybody goes nuts, and he leaves, and you know yeah. he's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, he's straight out of central casting. I mean, yeah, he makes he a great, you know, Middle Eastern dictator. Yeah. You know? he's, he's got the look. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, he's got the shifty look. I'll the tell you what. I think. Yeah, any, he's got it all going down. Any... <laughs> Any leaders of – here's what I dig about Middle Eastern leaders. They don't wear ties. I think that's so yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, me too. I mean, it's kind of constricting, you know. Yeah, they come out, like, looking they're going to, to go bowling. And yeah. I think that's <laughs> – I mean, I'm, seriously, look at them. Can you imagine that, Ahmed Dinajad and his bowling team? <laughs> yes, because I, I'm thinking that whoever's pin setting behind the wall better make sure that everything goes down when Ahmed throws his ball <laughs> – Oh, infidel! That was an eight eleven split. Are you crazy? Wait, wait, there's only ten pins. I'm sorry, eight, you know, seven and ten. They look around and make sure nobody's looking and they grab a beer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and what, yeah, we're making noise up by the uh, by by where everybody sits so that the guy can kick the next pin down. You know, oh look, it finally went down because we want Ackman oh. to be happy. But you know, but here's what I'm saying. I'm going to bring this and we'll bring this back into the arena yeah. of what we've been talking about. Sure. But I, I mean, I don't know that. It, it's central only to that some of us who understand or actually believe, I think a lot of people understand but don't believe, that you're going to have leaders who are handled and the poor slobs who fight the wars and the military who really believes until they finally clue it out that this thing is rigged. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of scenario we have, and it doesn't make a right. difference in a sense how it goes down, but the point is it's going to bring about war and people mm-hmm. are going to get killed. Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's destined for that. It's. And, and that kind of brings me to my next point as to where this is all coming from. Okay. And this isn't coming from human beings. No. This is coming from spiritual force, yep. forces of darkness. That's where, it, that's the origin of these things. And that's where, why we have the problems that we have with warfare and poverty and disease and on and on and on. It's because of spiritual warfare and because of the uh, forces of darkness and uh, their leader, Lucifer, whom we know as Satan. Well, you know, people listen to this and, and they they don't want to go with that. I understand. Well, that's they'll, tough, they'll, but we're going to keep telling them. But you know, but this is what sends people <laughs> to believe all this other crap that's written about it, as if it's a real, organic, and undetermined end. Mm-hmm. And they get all the pundits that get out there and right. talk about it. And it's like, and, and you, I mean, and they go vote in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I liked it though. That was great. I, I, I tell you what. What Kerouac wrote about Iowa was so pretty. He said in his last paragraph uh, in On the Road, in Iowa, I know the children are crying where they let the children cry. I mean, it is like that. It is. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you, you know, the old story about, oh, I, I kept my doors unlocked. Well, Iowa is the last place that I left my doors unlocked. Yeah. In the I've hope that. Of, uh, 
from the Midwest in general, although it's really changed a lot, I'm sure. I don't think you could equate Iowa with, say, what, Ohio or Illinois. But uh, I think in, uh, everything I've seen about the Midwest, uh, you know, or at least Iowa, I should say, in, in recent years, it seems like the way America used to be. It's really a lot more like Leave it to Beaver land. You know, the, the good America, or the way I thought of America being such a good place, you know. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know anybody from Iowa. You know, I've met one person. I've dated a girl from there once. And she was talking about how Iowa was, you know, such a, a great place to live. You know, it was, you know, kind of safe and nice and, you know. And that's, uh, <laughs> I think, kind of along the lines of what you're talking about. Well, in, when I was in Iowa, I was in a, a graduate assistant baseball coach at, at Iowa State in Ames. Mm-hmm. And the reason I didn't leave my doors locked is I was so poor, I was hoping somebody would break in and leave something. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, man. I lived on 505. Take your Radio Shack equipment, right? <laughs> well, in those days, I, I, was, I, was, I had to write articles on a typewriter. Can you imagine that? Not even an electric clack, typewriter. Clack, clack. You got it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, at any rate, um, 505. Well, we're sharp. We're really being nice to Iowa. <laughs> but, I mean, it's true. Iowa, Iowa's cool. I like Iowa. 505 <laughs> Duff Avenue. That's where I live in Ames. Yeah. Anyway, who cares? Um, but, oh, well. But, but you raised something, and I'm not going to give anything away. I think I'm, uh, when people listen to this audio, it'll be too late, but I'm doing a live show tonight, the last one I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and I want to bring something up about the American psyche, including – all of us, the one percenters who get it inside the one percenters in America who are patriots and are supposed to get it. Well, they don't. But this whole idea, and my point is, and I'll just make this statement, there is no such thing in reality as freedom. It is a mental concept that has been emblazoned in all our brains. Right. And when you really take a look at that place we're supposed to get back to, it really doesn't exist. Right. It really doesn't. And you and I know it. I mean, we all would like to go back to our childhood, and I'm really – Guilty on all charges with that, but I understand this. It sucked back then, yeah. but it's just that I don't want it to suck in my brain. Well, we just didn't know it. We just didn't understand it, and we couldn't see it. And and it wasn't as 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 bad in your face back no. then. No, it wasn't. That is true. But everybody's thinking okay. in America that we have to get back to that. We have to get back, you know, to that. There was never a time, folks. Yeah, we thing- have an idyllic America in our, there you in our go. minds. There you go. You know, the America that where everything works out great and everybody's happy and everybody's prosperous, everybody's free, uh, everybody has a good job, has a nice house, you know, everybody, uh, you know, it's mom and dad and buddy and sis and everything's just great. All right, and, now. Uh, oh, gosh, I wish it was like that, but All it right. just isn't, you know. Hold I on. I can sit and dream about it, but it, it doesn't really exist. However, and I'm not being clever about this, but this is what we're, this all ties in, and that is, now let's look back at pre-World War II Germany getting their, you know, balls up in a tizzy and their pecker raised and their nostrils flared. Did they not, did, did not Hitler <clears throat> and the magicians play on that same thing? Sure. They were hearkening a population back to a time that didn't ever exist. Right. Right. I mean, do you, uh, speak to that, if you will, because that is a very, very heavy psychological motivator. Well, one thing that really motivated a lot of people to follow Hitler uh, uh, from a cultural standpoint is after the First World War and all the, the social and, and cultural chaos, uh, many people wanted to go back to what they thought of as a previous era where everything was uh, well organized and there was a you know a decency and uh, you know there was peace and and uh, an organized life uh, when you when you look at the Weimar Republic and especially in the larger cities and in particular Berlin uh, it it was like a social cultural war zone I mean Berlin was a basically a cesspool you know morally uh, all kinds of uh, sexual degeneracy was going on you know there were clubs uh, there were nightclubs where people could go in which were predominantly say sadomasochist you know people would go in and uh, you know pay a certain amount of money and 
they would find a particular prostitute, you know, and they would have a sadomasochistic, you know. But doesn't the movie Cabaret capture on, that? You know? What's that? Doesn't the movie Cabaret capture that? Yes, it does to an extent, yeah. I mean, I was when that first came out, I don't know about you, but I mean, you know, we're only a year or so apart. I, I, I didn't have the historical context mm -hmm. to understand what they were showing. Mm -hmm. It didn't make sense to me. Right. Because, you know, you hear that famous line when, uh, oh, gosh, I, I don't know who was the, uh, the famed German actor that was in there at the time, the blonde. And he and, and he uh, and uh, uh, Michael York. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, German. He wasn't. He plays German, but you know, yeah, right. Michael York. Well, he, he played an Englishman who had gone to Germany to teach English. Right. He was trying to have a career as a teacher. And he looks at the crack door to Liza Minnelli, and she says she, she's screwing this guy. And then Michael York says, "So am I." Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, gender bending and uh, oh, bisexual. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, people were. Way over the top. I mean, uh, I, I've read things by uh, I believe the guy's name is Isherwood. He was a uh, he was an Englishman, a writer who was living in in Berlin during the the Weimar Republic, and uh, he wrote about you know the sexual degeneracy there, not not just uh, sexual degeneracy, but they also had a uh, huge problem with drugs. Cocaine was uh, was was very much uh, you know being used, uh, and uh, and morphine. Uh, I don't think they had heroin at that time, but there was a lot of there was a lot of drug use. There was even uh, the use of uh, psychedelics, in, in particular peyote, and uh, you know, uh, kind of kind of a uh, uh, I would, wouldn't say a mirror image of what's going on in this country, but you know, a very uh, you know a, a rough parallel of what's going on with American society since the 60s and 70s. All right, but now remember Peacock, and Peacock yeah. makes a case, and I, I don't think he makes it like he has to argue it. He documents it that Germany was, and I never really looked at Germany in this sense because I would always go like to France and Britain in my mind. Mm -hmm. But at, at the time during the Weimar Republic, I mean, Germany was was the cultural where it's at. Right. They had the writers. They had the philosophers. They had the Bauhaus movement. Yeah. They, they had. Uh, Dada, which was, uh, you know... A, Dadaism, yeah. Yeah, Dadaism. But but the thing is, at that point, they were where it's at. And I don't exactly. think many people, and I certainly would never, until I had encountered the book, and you know, Peacock's book, Ominous Parallels, mm -hmm. and then went back, and then I realized, holy mackerel, I mean, as much as we used to, like, make the fun of Germany, is like, das Boot, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and that's all they're good for. Uh and that they were, no, they were the center. It wasn't Paris. It wasn't London. It was Germany. And then, do I have this right? You tell me. We see a certain kind of now heading over the mountain where things now start to get debauched. Mm -hmm. And it gets corrupt and it gets purient. You know what I mean? And now you've got a society ready for a fall. Exactly. All right. All right. Are we, now, look at us. Are we there? Oh, yeah. I think we've really been there. All right, let, let, let me run this by you because it blew me away. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, folks, I missed this. I'm such a sheltered person. Now we have not wife swapping, but couples in like these little clusters that all, <laughs> right, and they call it polyamorous. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, we're polyamorous. I'm like, so yeah. what are you telling me? In other words, you can do whatever you want to do. Just throw a label on it. Find a reason why we do it, you know, psychologically, and it's okay. Well, I'll tell you the one thing that indicates to me that we have just gone down the drain as a as a society is the, this pedophilia thing that's going on. Uh, yes, it's it's underground to some extent, but I mean, when a major university has a scandal breaking out about pedophilia, uh, and you know, and a former uh, former defensive coordinator coach, you know, is, is being brought up on charges of molesting kids. And it's, I mean, that's really over the top to me. I mean, I don't see how a society which has that going on behind the scenes can, you know, can continue to, to thrive and can continue to progress. I really don't think so. No, and remember, a word also about this as an aside, thank you for bringing that up. But I had the interview with Lynn Crook, um, who talked about uh, pedophilia. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have some other people come on about that, too.
because it's America's not little but big dirty secret now. It is to me. It is the most debased, yep, disgusting, horrific uh, uh, thing that's ever happened as far as a a trend within our society. And I don't know how deep th- this filth goes, but uh, apparently there are things going on behind the scenes among certain elite. Uh, pedophile groups, and apparently they they work together in in uh, networking to obtain uh, these children to abuse. Uh, that is so vile, so evil. You know that if you don't believe in the devil by now, I don't know what it would take for you to believe in it. When you see something like that. Well, I asked Lynn Crook in that interview that we did mm-hmm. what she thought would happen with uh, the Penn State situation. She said it'll get brushed under the rug. And you know, this, she's probably she's right. probably right. In fact, they just something just popped up the other day, and that's mainly because now Penn State has got a new football coach, O'Brien from mm-hmm. a, from the Patriots. Yeah, but we you want know, to talk about that a lot. But we don't want to talk about that scandal. No, and that no. that thing is being and, and of course there are some voices which I don't think are sensationalistic. I think that they're trying to hang on to this to say, folks, there's something bigger here, and mm-hmm. that is we might have a Franklin cover up. Going on oh, with yeah. the second mile. Um, I'd be willing to bet you that there are wealthy, powerful people that were involved in this this ring. I, I believe there is a ring that that uh, Sandusky was involved with, and I also believe that there could well be politicians, you know, behind that, and and people in in positions of power to cover these things up. I mean, it couldn't have gone on all those years the way it did. Something is wrong there. When when this this gross, immoral evil, perverse behavior has been covered up for how many years? And and nobody knows what's going down? And this one guy, I I love this one coach, this McCrary or whatever his name was, this idiot going, you know, I wouldn't call my dad about it and ask him what to do. You know, hey, man, why didn't you call the cops and tell them what was going on? (coughs) It made no sense. Well, uh, I went to the coach. Man, what are you, you know, know, know. eight years old? Yeah, I went to the coach when I was a little kid, but come on. I said to Lynn during the interview, and you you would do the same as I would. I said to her is, you know, I, I spent time in uh, collegiate acad- um, athletics, and I can tell you that I never saw it, and I can tell you that if it happened, there'd be such a, a bad ass kicking first yeah, of all. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Some people would be kicking some serious butt. Right. And then we would call the cops afterwards and say he yeah, slipped in his shower. Get his ass out of here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, not that I'm such a bad dude, but that's the way things were back then. Yeah. And that's when I said to her, I'm going, i got to tell you, Lynn, you know, I'm not naive. I've been at Division One programs. I was in this situation for 20 years, and, man, that would not, I mean, I'm sorry, that is just, nope, wouldn't happen. But, however, now that individual who was, what, what the quarterback's coach or something like that? Yeah. Uh, he also, now, now he's backtracking from his statements. I mean, the whole thing is a dumpster fire. The whole thing is a dumpster well, fire. It's obvious they didn't want to get that dirt, that filth, or, you know, on, on the program. In other words, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to, you know, splatter it all over the program. So they do what they, what they think they should, which is to cover it up. Um, what I did say to Lynn. It shows a moral. Uh, bankruptcy. Just, yeah. Degeneracy within yeah. that group. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but. I don't have anything against anybody at Penn State or any of the players, but I'll never be able to look at that school, you know, again as a place that I would want a kid to. You know, I would not want to send my son to play ball there. Well, I wouldn't I t- want anything to do with with that kind of program uh, uh, or with that kind of administration. Well, that's that's true too. But I'll say this: that's just me. That that's a, that stuff though went on. Mm-hmm. With the camps and such that coaches are allowed to run, you know, as I do football coaches and coaches at schools to sweeten their salary, which at times is not all that great. Yeah, yeah. They're allowed to run camps. The camps, I understand. Yeah, it was, it was with the camps. Yeah, allow yes. the coach to have a, a larger income because a lot of times coaches don't make very much money. Right. You know, especially in high schools. And so my you point know. was it was not necessarily involved with the football program. It was that yeah. Sandusky was blessed by the football program and allowed to run camps, which 99% of the time would work out great as they do this very day. Right. But then when it was seen that this was the situation, and I'll say this, I, can't, I can look at Penn State, I, w- I would send my kid to Penn State, but I would never look at Paterno the same way again, which I never really trusted anyway, by the way. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would say. It's like, you know, you, dude, had to go. 
I always thought Paterno was being set up uh, on a pedestal. Yes, he was. And, and was I always thought that was a bunch of jive. I mean, um, we have uh, you know I've seen that with a lot of coaches are put up on pedestals. Um, and I'll, I won't get into that, but <laughs> no. And I'll say this, which is very uh, salacious and unfair for me to do, but I'm going to say it. When I was coaching at Columbia, as in Ivy League, yeah, uh, we had some conversations about that was supposed to be, and this is like 85 or so or 86. I got that right, 86, yeah, around there. Uh, the creation of the Colonial League, where all teams that went in there would be free of like all the chicanery. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention names. I'm just not going to do it. But <laughs> one of the coaches I was involved with said. You know, as soon as you start something, the program gets corrupt right from there on. And I said, well, what about Joe? And he looked at me like, hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, you know, don't tell him I'm okay. Yeah, that's one of those moments <laughs> where you realize that your your illusions are being shattered. Yes, it's like, a, a, yeah, a Hanson, you are from Jersey, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> we let you come over the river and, and, and just leave it at that. Yeah, I, I can kind of see that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you though, and I'm, I'm telling war stories, but damn it, I'm allowed to. Um, it's it's your show. It's my show. <laughs> it's my delusion, and you're welcome to it. But I will tell you something: fall baseball yeah. on the Columbia baseball field, knowing that Garrick had been there, people like that, uh, with the leaves changing and the field situated between uh, the Hudson right. and the East Rivers. I got to tell you though, Larry, it was sweet. Yeah, it was sweet. And yeah. then walking past the football field, knowing that Kirawak had been on that field, and I don't know. It it you know it was great, and the kids were tremendous. I, yeah. it, it's just that I couldn't talk about throwing fast. I had to say velocity. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't call it a baseball. It had to be a horse-sized spheroid. <laughs> no, but, well, I've uh, always heard Columbia had a real high academic standard there. I didn't know yeah, that. Figure, I, yeah, and figure them letting me there. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Actually, yeah, they. I just see you as you know just the the perfect uh, you know uh, baseball coach at an Ivy League institution. <laughs> Actually, those kids would agree with you. Uh, they they uh, would not let me into their school of journal, graduate school of journalism, so I fixed them and I, and I became a baseball coach. <laughs> That'll teach you. Oh man, That's, that was great stuff those days. Anyway, uh, so here we are back looking at our society, and we're looking at that of Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a third factor in here, and that is we we see a repetition. Here of, and that's what what Peacock was trying to drive home, uh, right. and and it, and it is ominous, and it is a parallel. Well, you know, when you see the influence of of spiritual evil, you you inevitably at some point will see the influence of sexual perversion. It, it just seems to. I mean, all through the Bible, you know, uh, we see uh, elements of sexual perversion being uh, associated with. Uh, with Satan and with the, the powers of darkness, which leads me to uh, something that I wanted to talk about today. I, I said I would talk about uh, the hierarchy of evil, and I, I have some some material here I'd like to talk about. Go ahead. Uh, since the fall, there's been a spiritual hierarchy, according to the Bible, there's been a spiritual hierarchy of, of demons, angelic princes, if you like, who rule the underworld and the world. And uh, this is brought out by the Apostle Paul uh, in Ephesians 6:12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And also uh, another passage in the Bible which, which talks about the hierarchy of the demonic, uh, of the evil, is uh, Revelations 9 and 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, that's, that, those are things that I know and I believe because the Bible is telling me about them. I've also done some research on some things that I believe to be true, and uh, I will uh, I'll read some passages which, which back up, or, or some passages which led me to a certain belief in, in the hierarchy of uh, a satanic spiritual hierarchy. Uh, this is from a history of Indian literature by uh, Professor Maurice uh, Winternitz. 
throughout the Buddhist canon, we come across passages which presuppose the existence of that very ancient religious tradition known as the Vedas. Vedic literature led us well nigh into prehistoric times and for the beginning of epic poetry, too. We had to dispense with all certain dates. Orthodox Hindus hold that the Vedas existed even before the creation of the world, co-eternal with Brahman. The three spheres of the vertical universe of the original Vedic sages was believed to be the abode of 33 gods, the eight Vasas, the eleven Rudras, the twelve Adityas, Dias, Zeus, and Prithvya of the earth. Um, what he's saying there is that uh, he's not talking about uh, a satanic spiritual hierarchy, but he's he's talking about the Hindu Vedas, and there are apparently 33 gods with a little g, which I would I would equate with with demons. Then we go on to another uh, 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 publication about Hindu beliefs, the Quarterly Journal of Vishva Hindu Parashad of America. Uh, incorporated, which is January, March of 2001, states, The perceptible world is a manifestation of the Supreme Spirit, thus becomes a collection of 33 symbolic divinities called the 33 gods. And then uh, later on it states, In the Vishnu Purina, Purina, Book 1, it states, These 33 divinities exist age after age, and their appearance and disappearance is in the same number as the sun sets and rises again. Uh, I believe this this demonic her- uh, hierarchy uh, is the same as the Great White Brotherhood, which uh, Blavatsky talks about. There are quite a few uh, writers uh, of uh, uh, occult literature uh, who who talk about the Great White Brotherhood, which I believe is this spiritual hierarchy. Uh, this is from the Mission of Mysticism by Richard Kirby. The demonic hierarchy is called the Great White Brotherhood. The externalization of this hierarchy will be in the form of two councils, the Council of Nine and the Council of Twenty-Four. These two councils are dealt with in uh, in many, many uh, occult uh, books. Uh, This is from a a book called Stargate Conspiracy by Lynn Pinkett and Clive Prince. Dr. Paschal Beverly Randolph, Reuben Swinberg, who is Clymer's mentor, believed that throughout history a series of initiatory orders has existed which is controlled by higher spiritual beings known as the Great White Brotherhood. And Clymer claimed that the Grand Master of this order was Rosicrucian, the Rosicrucian order, uh, Fraternitas Rose Crucis, was directly accountable to them. More important is the fact that Randolph used the name hierarchy to describe these higher spiritual beings, the same term used by Bailey, Hertog, Puharich, and Whitmore. And besides believing that a council of nine directs certain esoteric schools from France, Randolph of a council of 24, which also appears in Hutar, Her, excuse me, Hertog's The Keys of Enoch, interestingly, Randolph believed that spiritual beings from other planets often visit the Earth. Well, I believe... There are beings, spiritual beings, that visit the Earth, but I don't think they're from other planets. And I think you get my drift there. Oh, yeah. No, I got no problem with that. And uh, I, I believe that it's mirrored, this this uh, hierarchy of 33 is mirrored in uh, the European Union, uh, the European Council of Princes, which was created in 1946. It just happens to be made up of 33 royal princes. And the current head of the European Council of Princes is Prince Michael James Alexander Stewart. And the Stewarts are a very uh, uh, famous family, uh, very much involved with uh, the occult literature and occult beliefs of the, of the Merovingians. And I was going to go on and talk a little more about the Merovingians, but actually talk quite a bit more. Um, this is from a uh, – I have a series of articles and uh, also going to – Try to get to a thing by Peter Lamenda uh, about uh, the the Grail bud, bloodlines. Uh, this is from a book by David Livingstone, or, or an article by David Livingstone, uh, called Rothschilds and the Grail Bloodline. I won't go a great deal into the Rothschild thing, but uh, it, it, this is a very interesting article. Jacob Rothschild, the current head of the Rothschild dynasty, has intermarried with the Sinclair family. 
forging an important alliance between the head family of, and I don't like this term, but the Illuminati and the supposed descendants of the Grail family. As has been popularized recently by Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code, or before him by the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Stuarts of Scotland are supposedly descended from King Arthur and Jesus Christ. These families, of course, are not descended from Jesus. The idea is preposterous, but they are related to the Holy Grail, and they are not Christians but Kabbalists. In reality, they, like all the aristocratic bloodlines that form the core of the Illuminati, are descended from Guillaume de Gelon of the 8th century A.D. Guillaume's father was Rabbi Machir, among the Exilarchs who ruled the Jews in Baghdad, who was sent west after a dispute over the successorship. In France, he took the name Theodoric, married Alda, the aunt of Charlemagne, and was appointed king of the Jews in the region of the Languedoc, which is his capital, the city of Narbonne. Narbonne then became the heartland of the medieval Kabbalah. The Kabbalists of Narbonne seem to have been responsible for instigating the Crusades in order to retrieve the sacred text that had been buried there, but which had been inaccessible because of the first of the rule of the Romans and then the Muslims. Once Jerusalem was conquered, a Kabbalistic order of knights known as the Templars conducted excavations and discovered the text of the Sefer HaBahir, which revived the lost mystical tradition and set off the cultural revolution of the medieval Kabbalah. Another aspect of the penetration of these Kabbalistic ideas was the heresy of the Cathars. The Cathar foothold was in the region of Toulouse, the bastion of the descendants of Guillaume, also known as the family of the Gilgamids, several of whom were ardent defenders of this heresy. However, the Cathars have been idealized by numerous propagandists as having been innocent victims of church persecutions. But the Cathars rejected the God of the Bible in favor of the worship of Lucifer and practiced witchcraft. It was the Cathars who influenced the heretical aspects of the Templars for which the order was disbanded in 1307. Part of this Kabbalistic revolution was the legends of the Holy Grail, which include Cathar and Templar themes and formulated in the region of Aquitaine, another stronghold of the Gilamids. The Holy Grail, or San Grial, should have been translated as San Grial, or royal blood, because it referred to the sacred bloodline that supposedly issued from Guillaume de Galon and ultimately King David, but which in reality was understood to represent the descendants of the fallen angels and their leader, Lucifer. This was kind of a, uh, well, it was a revelation to me. It was interesting, and I started looking into it. And there's more than one author, uh, one researcher, who is saying that the, the actual grail bloodline uh, dates back to the idea of the Nephilim and uh, the uh, fallen angels uh, having uh, sex with the, the daughters of men. That's from a passage in Genesis uh, Genesis 6, 1, and 4. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters of, were born unto them, that the sons of God, you'll notice sons of God, uh, which we could, we could say is... Uh, the fallen angels, I, I'm not really sure about that, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, they became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Uh, the Merovingian dynasty, uh, the the Grail bloodline people, uh, claim that their ancestry uh, dates back to Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Uh, I'm going to talk about how that mythology was was put together, and uh, we'll talk about the cult of the Black Virgin. And uh, from an article in, uh, by Barbara Ajo, the satanic bloodline, the Antichrist and false prophet. She says, during the first century A.D., Alexandria, Egypt, was a veritable hotbed of mystical activity, a crucible in which, according to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and I quote, Judaic, Mithraic, Zoroastrian, Pythagorean, 
hermetic and neoplate platonic doctrines suffused the air and combined with innumerable others. It was in the early centuries of the Christian era that the ancient worship of the mother goddess was introduced to Christianity by Jews who had fled Israel and embraced Alexandrian Neoplatonism, which is just a rehash of the Greek paganism. And going to quote uh, from Holy Blood, the Neoplatonists are Greek philosophers who lived long enough after Plato to have lost the name of Platonist as far as modern scholars are concerned, although they are, in effect, disciples of Plato and consider themselves Platonists. It was in the Gnostic culture of Alexandria that the mother goddess evolved into Mary Magdalene. Ian Begg wrote in The Cult of the Black Virgin that, quote, many of the finest Gnostic writings are of Alexandrian inspiration or origin. Alexandria is also the main source of Gnostic works linking Jesus with Mary Magdalene. According to this tradition, it was through the Magdalene, rather than through Peter and the male apostles, that Jesus transmitted his secret doctrine. Well, we all know that Jesus had no secret doctrine, or at least we as Christians do not believe that Jesus had a secret doctrine. And he himself said, and I'll just paraphrase, that everything I've said was in public and, and in secret I have said nothing. So that right there is, is heretical. Uh, also from a, a, a book called The Mary Magdalene Files by the same author, there is no necessity to endeavor to crowbar Mary Magdalene into a Galilean setting, for there are no other intriguing alternatives for her place of origin. Although there was no Magdala in Judea in her day, there was a Magdalene in Egypt just across the border, which was probably the Migdal mentioned in Ezekiel. There was a large and flourishing Jewish community in Egypt at that, at that time, which was particularly centered on the great seaport of Alexandria a seething cosmopolitan melting pot of many races, nationalities, and religions, and perhaps where the Holy Family had fled to escape the depredation of Herod's men's men. Excuse me. The reason I, I brought that up is, is to talk about uh, the cult of Isis, which is involved with the uh, with the bloodlines, uh, the, the Grail bloodlines. And uh, briefly. Uh, Oh, I'll, I'll use another occultic uh, author, Manly P. Hall, who's a famous uh, Masonic author. Among the Egyptians, Isis is often represented with a headdress consisting of the empty throne chair of her murdered husband. And this particular structure, peculiar structure, was accepted during certain dynasties as her hieroglyphic. That's from Manly P. Hall, Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian Symbolical Philosophy. Isis was the embodiment of of authority and divine right to rule was by her authority. Papal and kingly thrones all hark back to the lap of Isis. Well, you can see right there that this this uh, uh, is leading into the idea of the authority of, of the kings and divine right of kings. It goes on to say, divine right of kings would explain the longevity of the cult of Isis and her esteem among royalty who believed themselves to be descendants of a divinity. Lewis Spence wrote in ancient Egyptian myths and legends that the cult of Isis has survived from the dynastic period of Egypt through the classical period and the Holy Roman Empire, and as today, principally carried on in Paris, the location of the Priory of Sion. Isis, or Ast, must be regarded as one of the earliest and most important conceptions of female godhead in ancient Egypt. In the dynastic period, she was regard regarded as the feminine counterpart of Osiris, and we may take it that before the dawn of Egyptian history, she occupied a similar position. No other deity has probably been worshipped for such an extent of time, for her cult did not perish with that of most other Egyptian gods, but flourished later in Greece and Rome and is seriously carried on in Paris today. Peter Dawkins wrote in The Great Vision that in the Kabbalistic mysticism, the throne Isis also represents the temple in which the union of the virgin soul to the spirit Lucifer takes place. The union, which is achieved only by the highest adepts and masters, produces the Christ child, who is the living embodiment of light, which Dawkins states is the meaning of Horus. In other words, Horus is the incarnation of the spirit, Lucifer. The enthroned lady or heavenly queen is the ancient title of Isis, the virgin mother of Horus, as also of Mary, the virgin mother of Jesus. The hieroglyphic symbol of Isis 
used by the ancient Egyptians was that of a throne, Isis being the actual throne or seat upon which the child Horus sits as king of light, the sun king. The same symbol is employed in Christian iconography, and Mary is portrayed as the throne or seat with the, with the Christ child seated in her lap with his head aligned with her heart. It is carefully constructed an important symbol revealing many mysteries. Yeah. In the Hebraic Kabbalah, the throne is described as the Merkaba, or throne of glory, the perfect dwelling place of the Lord. It is the supreme and pure tabernacle or temple in which the messianic presence of the Lord God may dwell and be manifest. That is to say, it is the perfect form of divine manifestation, the virgin soul, bride to the spirit, the sublime union of the receptive, responsive bride with the active creative spirit produces the Messiah or Christ child, the living embodiment of light, which is what the word Jesus or Horus means. In biblical terms, it means that the living soul, Adam, becomes a life-giving spirit, Christ, the former being a receptacle of life, the latter being a creator of life. The same symbolic sense that a moon may become a star or a light-receiving vessel may transform itself into a light-producing star, one of the cosmic forms of nature are born the shining suns of light. I never heard so much crap in my life. But anyway, any rate, um, that's Manly P. Hall. Uh, interesting, too, because if you think about it, uh, you look at the manifestations of females in uh, our government, mm -hmm. uh, the goddess of liberty, mm -hmm. which adorns, at least it did in the old days, silver dollars. Mm-hmm. On top of the dome of the Capitol is the Goddess of Liberty, although they renamed it to get away from that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Exactly. And yeah. what's interesting is also... It's very occult. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, look at D.C. That is, that is definitely uh, that is, a, a cult central. You know, a lot of people uh, have pointed that out, and many of them have been made m mercilessly fun of. They, they've been ridiculed for it. But it simply is a fact that there's a tremendous amount of occultic symbolism put there by Masonic, uh, uh, you know, people that that it was intentional. Now, you, you already spoke about Isis and Osiris. You have you have Isis, um, the female mm -hmm. uh, embodied in the Capitol Dome, which is basically a tit. Upon which sits the goddess of liberty, which they placed there in uh, somewhere in the 18, uh, it was I think 1864 or eight, I right. forget. It, it, it most closely, uh, you know, just just to you know the naked eye, it most closely uh, resembles a, a breast with a nipple. Yeah, I mean that's what that's it's what the different. dome is. Yeah, and that's it's, what it is, and it sits in view of its male counterpart, which is the Valley obelisk. Yeah. Right. So exactly. And I, I don't, you know, I don't mean to beat this to death. I don't know if we've ever spoken about this before, but I mean, I got a little bit of a problem with the United States taking their 13, 13 colonies, mm -hmm. 13, yeah, making them states and the 14th territory. They choose not to make a state, but the District of Columbia. Exactly. Now, Columbia is part of this whole female goddess thing that you, whether it's Semiramis or however you want to say her name, whether mm -hmm. it's Isis. Uh, whether it's the Queen of Heaven, which it all goes back to, because the Queen of Heaven is a satanic counterfeit of, of the Lord, mm -hmm. right? And uh, when you take a look at D.C., you have the 14th Territory in the story of Osiris's death and mutilation. Thirteen parts are found. Os Isis can't find the 14th, which is basically his dick. And so she creates a prosthetic, which is now we know as the obelisk. Mm -hmm. And where, what sits... What sits in D.C. looking across at the female uh, genitalia, uh, but the Washington Monument, which is 555 feet, go look it up, and times 12, that is 6660 inches, 6,660 okay. inches. And none, none of these things could be, you know, none of these things could be coincidental. They, could, they couldn't be there by not. accident. And the thing is, I'm not even blaming it on the Masons. I'm blaming it on Satan no, I don't and, and, and the, yeah, going back to Babylonian symbol symbology. Now, the other thing I have I to blame like, it on their father, the devil. That's of course, what that's what it's all about. Really, and, and they can't, you know. And and this whole thing, this whole DC was built. And let's not let's not shortchange this either. We have. What do we look at? Some of our buildings that we we just you know fawn over 
and they're in the pagan classical style of design, oh, yeah. both yeah. Roman and Greek. What is yeah, with Roman that? And, Roman and Greek architecture, Roman and Greek symbols yeah. are, are, are just all over everything. Why? And you know, then you take Rome was, you know, Rome had been a republic, but Rome was much more, much better known as being an empire that that went around exploiting and. You know the whole world of, of the of the ancient times. So we here is our capital, our beloved place, the seat of whatever you want to call it, and it is absolutely rife and infested with nothing but occult symbology. And exactly. For, and for all the stuff that's on the dollar bill, which everybody understands now, there's something I find reprehensible. Yeah, I have right there, you know, right in your face, literally. All right, but tell me this now: this could have been so easily not done. This is what pisses me off. Yeah. You take a look at the face of the dollar, you go up into the upper right-hand corner in that scallop there, and what is in there along with the number one except an owl? Yeah. All right, now, guys, tell me about this. Tell me why it was so necessary to throw a minute owl up in that right-hand corner of a dollar. That well, is. I think the whole thing is they enjoy putting it in your face and laughing at you because you can't see what they're trying to do. You know, Uh it, I know, but, it's but, a strange, perverse thing that they do where where they put these symbols in front of the people that they consider to be the unwashed masses, the the uninitiated, shall we say. Uh, they enjoy putting those symbols up in your face and laughing that you can't see what they're trying to tell you. And yet when people do, and then you get all the debunkers that come out because oh, yeah, they, they yeah. have access to mainstream media. Yeah. Oh, well, of course, this means this and that. No, screw you. It's a lie. Yeah. There's no reason in the world you had to do that, and you did it. Uh, and, and, of course, the one thing that's even beyond funny is, you know, standing out in New York Bay right. is the statue of Isis with her mm -hmm. flame and torch, uh, the illuminating torch. And, that's, and that was from our French Freemason brothers. Right. Uh, you can take that thing and stick it somewhere, too. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, the same, it's the same symbol. The, the woman is the same thing. I mean, it's Semiramis in the times of Babylon, uh, Babylonian uh, uh, paganism, you know, Nimrod, Semiramis, and or Semiramis and, and uh, uh, Tammuz, and then you go on to Isis and Osiris, and you know, and then uh, you know the, you know, and then they then they put it into Christianity. They, they take this paganism, put it into Christianity, and bring Mary in as the Queen of Heaven. Well, the Queen of Heaven was exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, as uh, in the Bible. That's right. It's a, it's a counterfeit. It, yeah. it, it goes back to Nimrod and his mother, who supposedly had the virgin birth. Right. Begatting Nimrod. And that's why we have Easter, because let, why? Let me read something from an occultist, uh, Tracy Twyman, uh, in the Apocalypse <laughs> Plot, a Merovingian Antichrist, in question mark. Uh, Cain okay. followed a number of cities himself, founded a number of cities himself, and we've argued that he is essentially synonymous with Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel. Although the race of Cain is properly thought to be cursed by God, the Bible says that God placed a mark upon Cain and all his descendants, cursing those who would do them harm, even after the murder of his brother, Abel. In fact, the Cainites were remembered by every other culture as magnificent kings, teachers of wisdom, and builders of nations. Even the word king comes from Cain. He was worshipped by his people as a god, depicted in the form of a sea bull or a dragon. This was the Babylonian religion that the Hebrews found so idolatrous and offensive. It even included the sacrifice of babies in a fiery pit. And yet many of the Hebrews, including their kings, practiced this religion and intermarried with Canaanite women. Thus it is conceivable, if not certain, that the bloodline of Cain interbred with the Davidic bloodline that eventually resulted in Jesus. The Merovingian Franks alluded to their Canaanite descent with their legend that their founder, Merovius, was the spawn of a sea bull called the Kenator a word not to be found in a dictionary, but which is entomologically linked with the name of Cain. Perhaps it is this intermingling of holy and infernal bloodlines that the Merovingian descendants known as the Angevins were referring to with their use of the double-barred cross of Lorraine, said to represent both the blood of Christ and of Satan, the same artery in the same vein. It's just despicable, but a hey. Interestingly, the worship, even here, uh, an occultist is admitting that that paganism was was forced into Christianity in, in, in the uh, the uh, the Mariolatry. Interestingly, the worship of Jesus as God incarnate has led to the formation of a religion that, in all outward forms, is a resurrection of the old Babylonian religion of Cain. Well, I would uh, strongly uh, 
disagree with that. Object to that. Yep, sure. Uh, yes, Roman Catholicism is. Many of the ceremonies of Christianity, it doesn't say Roman Catholic, but Christianity, including Mass, Communion, Baptism, and Confession, which is not, Confession is not uh, Christian at all, it's Babylonian, but anyway, are taken directly from the Babylonian priesthood, as well as many of the symbols and idols used by Catholicism, she finally says that. The construction of the cathedrals represents the ancient pagan temples of Babylon, and even the structure of the priesthood is the same, along with the requirements of celibacy and wearing black. But most importantly, the deities are at heart the same. All the saints are said to possess powers that correspond with those of various pagan deities and are worshipped as many as such by many people, especially throughout the third world. The familiar statues of Mother Mary holding the baby Jesus mimic precisely those of Babylon's Ishtar holding her baby. She, like the Virgin Mary, was called the Queen of Heaven and the Mother of God. The traditional Catholic depiction of Mary ascending to heaven matches that of the Babylonian goddess in every detail. This depiction is also precisely described in the 12th chapter of Revelation. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. This woman gives birth to a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This person is either the Antichrist or his ancestor Cain. Both would match this description. The seven-headed dragon, as we know, is Europe. But one of the scarlet horror referred to in Revelation is riding on the back of the great beast the one called Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. There can be little doubt that Rome is the scarlet whore. You got that one right, honey. This is made clear when it is specifically stated the seven heads of the beast are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Rome was built upon seven hills. The ten crowns represent the ten kings who will be in charge of the European Union, presumably descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. I don't think so. The scarlet woman is also said in Revelation to be a possession of a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. It would be no stretch to equate this cup with the Holy Grail, a traditional symbol of the bloodline of Christ, and the womb that bore his descendants, the womb of Mary Magdalene, whose name, Magdal, is the Babylonian tongue means tower, as in Tower of Babel. She, too, is traditionally thought of as a whore and is worshipped in southern France as the incarnation of Ishtar in the form of the Black Madonna. She also is depicted in Catholic iconography as holding a vase filled with healing balm, as it says in the poem, Le Serpent Rouge, which she used to anoint Christ as the king of Judah just prior to his crucifixion. And we know that the filthiness of fornication with Jesus, that is ridiculous. And we know that the filthiness of fornication with Jesus is what begets the Merovingian bloodline that shall once more rule the European empire in the coming age. Now that, uh, it, it makes me sick to even say something like that to, to quote this woman, but these people are aware of the prophecies, but they twist them. Sure. And it's by the way, she amazing. was it's she was amazing how they. I mean, they're they're, they're better read uh, and more well versed on the Bible and prophetic passages in the Bible than most Christians are. Um, that's, that's scary. Uh, I want you to know before you bang me anymore. Uh, yeah. She was a guest on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Colvin brought her on. Uh, I know, I know. I, I remember him bringing her on. I mean, I, uh, I mean, she's got a lot that, right. That's his business, you know. <laughs> uh, well, that ain't going to happen anymore. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I but was kind of grossed out by it, but it was okay. <laughs> actually, she, like you said, she does have a lot of the, myth- well, you want to call it, maybe it's not mythology. That's probably a wrong word for it. But she has a lot of the, the symbology right, except yeah. that at the end, you, you have, of course, look. I here, think she's a very intelligent woman. I know. She, she writes well. <laughs> she's well read. She understands uh, mythology, and she understands the Bible. Uh, unfortunately, she's an occultist, and she believes in this Merovingian bloodline thing. And uh, she believes that, that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a sexual relationship, which produced uh, this this grail bloodline, and I don't. When you, and, when you deal with occultists, when you deal, as I have, with the Sarian and Red Ice and Chris Knowles uh-huh. and the late Kent Benkowski and all this other stuff, yeah. you yeah. find out in the end that really they got a case of the ass against Jesus Christ, which is they where it all do. goes down, right? They so, certainly do. Okay, and we understand that, and that's one of and the reasons. What a, and what a terrible way to smear the the image of, of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, than, uh, than to say he committed fornication with Mary Magdalene, and, and smearing Mary Magdalene as well. It's, it's just, that's awful. It's a, it's a terrible. Not only that, but if he indeed did not die on the cross, then there is no hope for us. 
because there is no remission for sin. Because he did not, if he did not die on the cross, if he did not descend into Hades, and he, and if he did not rise in the resurrection on the third day and ascend back into heaven after talking to his disciples right. and explaining what their mission would be, if none of those things happen, then Christianity is is a lie of a false religion, yep. and and we have no hope for salvation. There, yes. there is no way that we can repent and have our sins forgiven by by our our, our Lord. One of the thing, one of the I things. I mean, this, this what a terrible blasphemous. What uh, I don't know. I, I get fired up. You get fired up, but the point is, the point is that, and and I learned this early on. Uh, when I said that Jesus Christ is Savior, and that is take a look at anything that portends, portends, pretends, makes believe that it is a, quote, Christian religion, Mm -hmm. and you can find out right away where it is, where it's at, because the acid test is how do they treat Christ? And there you go. If you can deny Christ, his sacrificial component, it's all over with. It's done. It's all bogus. And they always do that. They always try to deny the divinity of Christ. But that is what the Lord gave us as a litmus test. You don't have to be a brainiac. You don't have to have an IQ above water to understand that that's what he told you. Who Mm -hmm. denies that Jesus is the Christ? Once you get that straight, and of course that's all. And there's a passage in the Bible, I'll paraphrase it, that says, Who is a liar? Save him. But those who say. Right. Yeah. Save him who says that Jesus was not the Christ. And you're seeing this among supposed Christians as well. So this is the way it's going to go down. It's happening Right according to, it, it's funny because those who would say that this is all scripted and it's bogus are actually fulfilling the prophecies themselves, which I think is right. an absolute riot. Right. But when you get right down to cases, whenever you tune in sometimes or flip through channels and someone's going on about God, about God, about God, I'm hanging there for one reason. Are you going to talk Jesus Christ? Oh, no? Right. Then you take whatever you're got, get it out of here. The Wayne you know, Dyers and all these other characters who come on with, oh, the God essence. No, I don't want to talk about God essence. I don't want to talk about God. Tell me about, do we have Jesus Christ here? No, I'm out of here. You know, one thing I've noticed about, uh, I'm, I'm having a senior moment here, but uh, the Lakewood Church in Houston, uh, the guy who is the pastor there and his father used to pastor that church. We're not talking about Osteen, are we? Osteen, oh, exactly. Oh, Oh, I, went, he's scary. I had the misfortune of once going to a service in that church, Woo. and I, I went at the request of uh, a family member. But at any rate, I won't get into that. But I listened to I was about maybe 50, 75 feet away from the man, and I listened to him preach. And it was all about improving your life, improving your life, and doing this and that and the other, and prosperity will come your way. But do you know that it, during the entire speech, he did not speak right. about Jesus Christ. No, not once. Nope. I mean, this is a church, you know? <laughs> the church of feel good right now, yeah. baby. The church of the Cadillac and discount <laughs> house religion. You got to believe God in someone. God does not want you to be poor. <laughs> if you got to believe in someone, you got to believe in me. <laughs> You're going to pay for that old Dorado with no Let's fives put and tens. Put your hand on the radio. Put your hand dark. on the dashboard. <laughs> yes. Yes. Send in your fifty dollars in cash, and we will send you a prayer cloth. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, I this, was... this message is brought to you from our station at Del Rio, no. Texas. Yeah, the Discount House of Worship. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Put in twenty bucks, fifty will be there oh, when you get man. there. I like the other one, uh, LL, the Wings of Moses. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but it, you know we laugh, but it does work. Uh, it works a lot. Well, you know, you have to laugh to keep from crying because there's an awful lot of good people, decent people out there who want to who want to follow God, you know, who want to follow uh, Jesus Christ and believe in Jesus. They believe in Him, but they go and they get involved with these churches of that nature and these these phony preachers who lead them down a primrose path, you know, and, and it's it's just sad it really is and they're not preaching the gospel and they're not helping those people progress as christians no and but... it, it's 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 just really sad they're in it for the it, uh, machiavelli once made the statement that religion organized religion is a means of social control and a way to make money that's exactly what those kind of churches are they are i mean he's absolutely right yeah i mean machiavelli understood uh 
you know, psychology of it all and understood how religion, how important religion was. And that's why he was, uh, he was studied by, by the fascists, especially Mussolini, uh, since he was an Italian as, as well and well known to, in Italian culture. His, his writings are real, well known uh, as, as a political philosopher. And, and Mussolini studied him, and one thing that he said in his writings over and over was, you must appear to be religious. You know, you must have, uh, you know, and, and in his time, he, he taught the princes, you know, uh, in, in his book, The Prince, uh, that, that they must have affiliation with the church and must, must appear to be religious. Of course, behind the scenes, a guy could care less, you know. Uh-huh. And, and I think that's the same thing with our politicians now. You know, they all, you know, want to wrap themselves in the flag and oh, then bump on a Bible, Bible, you know, and talk about their, 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 uh, their faith. They talk about their faith a lot. They don't talk about Jesus. Uh, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. It's my faith is important to me. Well, I mean, yeah. there are people who have faith in rocks, Did you I, know. <laughs> well, they're real. <laughs> Uh, by the way, um, did you see that article that I think I might have sent around or Chuck sent around where uh, Newt Gingrich converted to Catholicism? Yeah, I did. I, you asked me about that last time. Yeah, I, I did. did. Oh, see, now, that's nice that I have a senior moment when you don't. <laughs> and that's Andy Colvin. God bless him. Andy's like, oh, he's so very tolerant of me. Uh, <laughs> and he's so good about it. He goes, uh, Viz, we talked about that in, in 2006. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, all right. <laughs> Moving right along. Damn. There's uh, one thing I wanted to talk about uh, was uh, from go- going back to the connection with the Nazis and the occult, and that is in Peter Lavenda's Unholy Alliance. We're talking about the Cathars. Yes, and, yes, And it's yes, directly yes. related to what we're just talking about. Uh, it, the chapter is, is named Lucifer's Quest for the Holy Grail, and uh, it's about a particular SS officer, Otto Rahn, who did have a quest for the Holy Grail. And it... Uh, uh, Lavenda says, probably one of the most outlandish yet somehow oddly grand, strangely cosmic endeavors of the Third Reich in general, and the SS in particular, was Himmler's search for the Holy Grail. This was an actual program of the SS, a program which had been immortalized, has been immortalized in the first and third films of Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones trilogy. Uh, it was, after all, Otto Rahn, uh, R-A-H-N, who helped popularize the notion that the Grail was not the special property of the Catholic Church, should it actually exist and should it ever be found. For Rom, the Grail was an emblem set up in opposition to the established Church. Indeed, was a Luciferian symbol, and for this the Nazis were grateful. For if Rom's conclusion was correct, it gave them a philosophical and historical edge over organized Christianity. The Cathars were a type of fundamentalist Christian sect, and I I really don't think they were Christian, but they were a sect, that enjoyed enormous popularity in 13th century Europe, even among the nobility. Their beliefs included the doctrine that Christ was pure spirit and had never inhabited a human, that is, a material form, that the dead will not be resurrected in the body since the body was made of matter, which the Cathars viewed as satanic, that there were two forces in the universe, one of good and one of evil, that procreation was evil as it increased the amount of matter in the world and trapped souls within material forms. Naturally, they were branded as heretics by the church, and eventually Catholic armies were sent to destroy them under order of Pope Innocent III in 1209. What a name. I know. Isn't it ironic? <laughs> it really was. It was from a Catholic commander, a Cistercian abbot, no less, surrounding a French town composed of both Cathar and Catholic civilians, men, women, and children, that we received the immortal line, killed them all, God will recognize his own. <laughs> Does that sound, sound something like we heard from Vietnam? Yeah, yeah. Kill them all, let God sort them out. Yeah. That's where that came from, uh, Cistercian Abbot. But I want to bring something up, too, because one sure. of the, one, this is one of the things that I, I um, incensed me by the Collins brothers when they were talking about um, the innocence, excuse me, of the Vatican at that time and of the slaughter of the Cathars slash Albigensians, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And they, they popped and they off and said, well, they weren't Christian anyway. And it's like, oh, all right, so tell well, me. Well, that when, makes it okay to kill them. There you All right, fine, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so that, uh, go ahead, yeah, wipe them out. Yeah. Blow, blow their heads off. Hey, they're not Christians anyhow. Yeah, because it goes on beyond that, you know, with the Waldenses. Yeah, uh, the only good Indians are dead Indians. Yeah. 
and and <laughs> let's let's remember too, Huguenots. Yeah. yeah. And one, one of the one of the things that I, uh, you know, I remember. Um, oh, gee, the guy that does the Canadian ministry with orphans. Oh, he's such a big proponent of that. And I'm sorry now. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a a senior thing, but we talked about. I mean, he's you know, the Catholic Church had a lot to do with the abuse of the De Plessis orphans in Quebec. And um, yeah, I remember. I remember that uh, that guy on yes, your show. He was yes. a very interesting character. Yeah, you know, and I mean, I get emails all the time. Not necessarily. From was him. he a minister in a, in a church? No, he just was. You know, calling it out. I mean, he was yeah. more of a child, a children's advocate. Yeah. But I mean, when I talked, decent guy. I like. I liked it. He he was well spoken to. And when he was on, I mean, he was off air, and I just said, you know, I mean. Yeah, I'm not cool with what the Vatican did. He goes, well, neither am I. He said, he goes, they wiped out nearly all my antecedents. He said they were Huguenots who were, who were nearly wiped out by uh, the Vatican. You know, and there you go. And I mean, I, I'm sure that's got part of the reason why he's involved in all this kind of stuff. But it's like, you know, this is not cool, man. This is not what Christ calls anyone to do. All this stuff, the Inquisition, by the way, this was not what he wanted. And everybody goes out and just, and of course, you know, we've got that version going on here. Right. These other crypto Christians like Hagee and the rest of them is like, yeah, let's go kill Arabs because now I am, they're going to go after God's city. Oh, mm-hmm. Lord Almighty. And they may do that, but the Jesus will take care of it. He right. has never said for any Christian to pick up a sword, gun, or otherwise and shed blood. Yeah, what kind of gun did Jesus have? You know, an AK-47? or I, oh. It's never really clear to me. He probably oh. kept it in his Cadillac. <laughs> or his Mercedes. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, but we're looking at distortions left and right. And yeah. as you had mentioned before, look, what you're going to get in mainstream media, you're going to take the biggest idiot they can find. Right. And they're so going to promote yeah, that. I've heard you talk about this, and you're, yeah. you're dead right. You know, you, you can get somebody like an Ahmadina Jod, uh, you know, put him up against John Hagee, and they can, you know. Yeah rail at each other and then everybody sits there and says oh look this is all so crazy take a look at what's yeah. going on here so therefore and of course that's why I, I i'm slowed to anger about any supposed group because whatever mainstream media has given you is the most probably loose cannon crazy person in there mm-hmm. just so you can go ahead and be mad at them and that's the well, whole you know, idea it's, it's no fun to put a guy on there who uh We'll quote from the Bible and right. talk about the gospel and, and about Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross because of the love of God for, for you know, for mankind. Uh, you know, why would we want to get somebody up there who may quote passages from the, the Apostle Paul explaining, you know, the meanings of, of Christ, uh, you know, life and his sacrifices? Uh, you know, somebody who would speak in a logical manner and a normal tone of voice. We'd much rather have somebody like John Hagee get up there and yell and scream and and talk about how we need to go over there and whoop up on those Arabs, you know? Larry, we, we need that. You know, the, it makes for good theater. I mean, <laughs> I mean, again, this has got nothing to do with IQ or education. It's got right. to do with common sense or at least some kind of enlightenment. But what's going to happen is, I mean, we live in a cartoon culture, and right. they will demonize. I mean, we laugh at, at old movies where uh, there was no, uh, you know, before the talkies. Right. And then the bad guy showed up, and to make sure everybody knew it was the bad guy, he had to have a top hat, a Dudley Knight shaped, you know, mustache, and the pianist had to go, and then we all got it. That's the bad guy. And what did the right. crowd do? Go, right. boo, hiss. Well, you know, we later haven't on, evolved. of course, in the war movies of World War II, uh, you would always have the Japanese, uh, you know, officer. With the extremely thick glasses and the buck teeth. Right, there you, you know? go. And, 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 right, there you and go. you know what? The other day, my son uh, rented a video that was like a martial arts video. It was based on uh, a, uh, a martial arts, uh, it, it's a Chinese movie, okay? It's made in China. It's about this martial arts teacher who took on the Japanese. It, it's a long story, but at any rate, the villain in this was a, a Japanese officer who had. Very thick glasses there you and buck teeth. <laughs> and I thought, well, now, did they watch those old American movies? And uh, I guess they did. They thought, well, that's a good way to portray them. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right. uh. Oh. 
but now uh, if, white man with skin like ball pork. Right. There you go. You hear about the guy who went in and robbed the Chinese restaurant? Uh-uh. Pulled a gun on the cashier. He goes to take out. Uh, <laughs> never mind. All right, but let's get to one last that's thing. Before. Really, that's so bad. It's good. It's a Henny Youngman, and you know it. <laughs> that's a Henny Youngman style joke. Jeez. Absolutely. Um, but one last thing too, which I like to clear up before we end this one, if it's okay with you, and we sure. and maybe we can end on this, and that is, in the next week or so, I'm going to like kind of be drawing some stuff up about what I really think um, will be the real deal presented to us. And I do place and understand this. I mean, I place a lot of value on some of the projections that were made at the beginning of the 20th century. I think that these people knew what the plan was. Uh, if they were invested by uh, the dark side, that's mm-hmm. fine. It, they still will tell you the truth, as often you will get from the dark side, like Brzezinski and others who will tell you, they'll give you fair warning but not tell you that it's that. And the grand chessboard, I think, in 94 is a great example of that. All right, so where am I going with this? Um, Charles has sent some very provocative stuff to us, very interesting stuff, mm-hmm. and you have too, and others, and Liam as well. And... As you well know, I'm stubborn as hell and, and everything, but I, I do test things to say, okay, is it is it I don't like this because I don't want to like it, right. or, or is it because it doesn't fit in the schema, which I have to stay with because I believe that is correct. That is not of my own making. It's what I found, and this goes in with the informer right. and Montgomery and all this stuff. Now, here's where I'm going. In the futuristic works, and I'm just going to breeze through this, by McKinder, uh, by Robert U. Benson, which people are not availing themselves of. And I'm telling you, if you read that, you're going to find out what's going on. Uh, also with H.G. Uh, Wells uh, and others. Honestly, if, all right, if we agree that Satan rules exactly. right now, he does so from the Vatican. And he will protect his new Holy Roman Empire. The futuristic works never said that Europe was going to get trashed. They didn't necessarily identify Germany as some kind of wonderkind that might empower the Holy Roman Empire, though, let's face it, they've availed themselves of Germany. Well, Germany was always the primary nation, the the primary instrument of the Holy Roman Empire. But it always was. But isn't it interesting, it was always seen as the problem child. Uh, Ergo, World War I. And World War II. Well, I'm not sure I would say problem child. From a standpoint of it was a struggle between it and its desires and, say, France and Britain. But, but, but let me Germany ask you. Germany was always um, associated with the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the Second Reich was basically just uh, the Hohenzollerns uh, throwing in with the Habsburgs. All right. All right, so plainly, let me ask you. I think Germany has been used twice before, yes. and they may be being used again, not yeah. necessarily militarily, but, I mean, I see all this stuff that they're writing about. Well, you know, I mean, the stuff that they've written about Germany is voluminous, it's compelling, but what I still feel now before, this is the first time this has happened because I didn't have the reaction, obviously, in, in two past wars, right. but I'm starting to say to myself, and I've kind of said to Charles as well, I'm like, okay, I get this, but I'm seeing this as a very pejorative, bad spin to maximize, once again, the nasty old Germans. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that a lot of uh, material that, that's being passed back and forth is based on the, on the writings, and, and I'm, I'm not knocking the writers because I think they are sincere uh, I believe they're Christians, and I think they're sincere in their beliefs, but I think they're incorrect in, in some of their their uh, Conclusions. premises yeah. and some of their contentions. And uh, you have to understand that the writings that we're talking about, in particular with Charles, and I, I do not wish to insult Charles in any no, way. No, not at all. A great deal of respect for him. Yep. I believe he's a good Christian. But this is the stuff that, that – and I've used a lot of that material on the show here – but it's British Israelism, and I am not a proponent of British Israelism, and I, I don't really think we have time to go into what all that entails. But it is uh, it it is a a, a popular philosophical uh, uh, belief 
belief concept within within uh, con- contemporary Christianity. I do not believe that the people that that espouse that view are anti-Christ or anti-Christian in any way. But I I, I think they I think they go a little too far, and they too have a problem in in the fact that that they attribute bloodlines and genealogy that I just don't believe is there. I, in other I words, don't I don't right. believe that the Anglo-Saxons are, you know, the lost tribes, etc. Uh, there's a lot of Anglo-Saxonism in there. That and hey, I'm I, I'm of Anglo-Saxon blood, you know. Uh, I'm not knocking my own people, but I don't think that uh, the Anglo-Saxons are the lost tribes. I well, don't think you can prove that philosophic. Uh, I mean, uh, genealogically, I don't I don't think it can be proven. Well, th- there. Cons- that, that's all I'm saying. And again, I'm not trying to insult anybody. In fact, I used to believe this. I, I very strongly believe in that, but I don't think it can be backed up uh, All right. with uh, actual historical record. Uh, based on the Anglo-Saxon uh, con- contribution to uh, mm-hmm. culinary delights, I'm, I thank God oh, yeah. that, <laughs> that there, there, there's Chinese and Italian food because those people eat gruel all day long. I mean, <laughs> I grew up in, in a Nordic household, and it's like, what are we going to have today? Oh, Keith, we're going to have fiscabola. Fish balls, forget about it. <laughs> Fish balls, no thanks. And then you got smart and married an Italian. Girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, give me the meatballs and pasta. Um, but but um, here's where I'm going with this, and I really do believe this is the case. The futuristic works are written by, okay, authors, fine. Um, Benson was an Anglican who converted to Catholicism, whose brother was a Jesuit. Um, Mackinder, I don't know if he had any kind of sectarian uh, leanings. I don't, I don't think so. But because it came out of the city of London at a right, right about the first time, the first decade of the uh, 20th century, I do believe, uh, as Brzezinski told us in 1994 with the Grand Chess Board, they'll tell you what's going to happen because they know the, stri- uh, the script. Uh, right. Are they invested by the dark side? I would say yes, uh, without a doubt. And so I lean and I listen to them because they're more inclined to give you the real truth because nobody's really listening. You know what I mean? Right. And my feeling is this, that the Holy Roman Empire, Europe, will survive. It will not get a scratch on it. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it will, it will uh, exist and do fine through the Third World War, and then there will and come a time. And it t- will step in. Who? And it will be a, it will be a worldwide power. Yeah, when, uh, well, I think what will happen I is... I think what's going to happen is the Antichrist, is the way the Bible describes it, goes in and makes a peace treaty with uh, the Jews. You well, know, he, I, he arranges a peace treaty... Between uh, the Arabs and the Jews, I believe. I, I think you can say that, that that entity, whatever it is, and I wrote this to somebody who I'm just starting a dialogue with about what's coming on, I would say that it, it presents itself as a peacemaker for mm-hmm. a world that is war-weary and it right. just desirous of something that can bring about peace. Now, however, here's and the trip. And this will be such a monumental thing. Yes. I mean, this Third World War is going to be so horrific that the man who comes in and creates a peace uh, and creates a peace treaty is going to eventually be looked upon as a god because he will yes. claim he is, and an right. awful lot of people will believe it. This is the Antichrist. Well, it, it will come down to the point where you got to make your choice. Right. Like, uh, no matter what Dylan was or wasn't, I mean, that song, you got to serve somebody, yeah. rings very truthfully. Yeah, you got to play that as the outro, man. That's a great song. That's All right, now i got to go find it. Damn. <laughs> I hate this. All right, I'll do that. It's your show. <laughs> you know, and you, and everybody understands, Larry, the contractor guy, yeah. that every time you say that, you get the hand up the back of me, which is the puppet. <laughs> I should play. I have never put my hand. I've never met you. <laughs> well, it's kind that's of. That's the last place I'd want to put my hand. <laughs> it's not that funny, Larry. <laughs> It's not that funny. You got to see it from my side. Uh, no, I don't. Um, but but well, you started off saying that I, that uh, Larry, the cable guy, was better looking. So you know, uh, I've seen you both, <laughs> dude. We're just not into the, we're just not oh. into you. <laughs> what they, we're, just not, we're just not that into you. Yeah, we, we oh, you know what, what cracks. Man. Yeah, I mean, how can people look upon this? I mean, we get into these like the most abysmal bottom of the earth truth. You know, rotten stuff, and then we crack up at the end. That's great. Um, well, uh, you know, I know, I know. It's comic relief if you don't, man. You go nuts. I mean, 
I, I know that, that there are many times when I'm sitting around here and I'm reading and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, future world events, you know, apocalyptic events, and, you know. Yeah. I get so depressed, it's like, gosh, you know, i got to go, you know, listen to some music or, you know, go take a ride or, you know, do something, you know, get you just just to get my mind off of it. And if you can make a couple of jokes, it, heck, it, it helps an awful lot. Um, you know? as, as the pirate had said, if we couldn't laugh, we'd all go insane. Exactly. Uh, and as Dylan said, we got to serve somebody. And, no, that is very apropos. It's yeah. true because everybody thinks, well, if I don't make a decision, it, it's a, no, if you don't make a decision, the decision will be made for you. Yeah, and exactly. that's the whole point. And you've got as much time I mean, as you, you know, get. And they're going to force people into the position where through this uh, – through this economic bondage, in other words, if you don't take this mark, I don't know what that mark will be. Maybe it's a chip. Maybe it's a, a tattoo. I, you know, maybe it's a barcode. Heck, I don't know what it'll be. But whatever it is, if you don't take that mark, you can't buy and you can't sell. So you're going to starve to death. Uh, you Not only I... that, you're probably going to be considered an outlaw. You know, and people are going to be chasing you around trying to kill you. And I'll throw you into a concentration camp. Um, let's be honest about this too, because I think, and you're going to tell me if I'm right or not. Um, I've, always, you know, I, I've wondered for some time, especially after seeing all the in, in the post World War II era, yeah, uh, all the footage that for some reason is gone. And I'm not even going to uh, uh, attribute that to nobody sh- should have to see that again. I don't know. I just I don't I don't know. But uh, I I think. Um, I don't know what you saw where you were in the late 50s or early 60s, but some independent channels carried certain series, you know, uh, The Winds of War and all this. I mean, I'm talking about the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And we saw, I mean, I saw some stuff that was really, really upsetting. Yeah. Uh, And the children, you know, like I said, who were like four or five years old trying to figure out what this rubble in Warsaw was all about. It's like, kids, I hate to tell you, but you probably didn't live a year or two after this footage. Mm. Yeah. and so you plopped in whatever era you're plopped in, and that's the way it goes. And to think that you're going to be spared just because, uh, that doesn't really quite cut it. Right. Now we're in that era right now. And I was talking to Lady Viz before when we were uh, bicycling. I'm saying, you know, it's not, a good, it's not good news uh, as far as the, the fate of the world, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it wrong because, and I've said this to people who are I'm sensitive to who have chosen. I'm like, I'm sorry, man, but that – because you have children that are going to be raised in this thing, mm. it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Just like no. I'm sure who, whoever were having children in Poland and other places in 1925 never thought their 10-year-old would get their brains beat out on a tree. Well, there are a lot of people in the uh, in London, in the suburbs of London, who you know had kids and never re- never thought that somebody would bomb the city. Yeah, you know. There are a lot of guys that are driving a taxi in the streets of London who never thought a bomb would, you know, come into, you know, blow up a building in the middle of the street and and drop rubble on their taxi. You know, I mean, <clears throat> I'm just drawing that out. No, um, you, you, I mean, you know, the, the same in, in uh, what was it, Rotterdam? I think uh, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, they even uh, surrendered to the Nazis and the bastards went ahead and bombed the city anyway. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> You know, yeah, that's they, the kind of mentality these bastards had, and and I they still have the ones that exist today, and there's plenty of them around. Uh, you know, the second, third generation of the Nazis. It, this time around, uh, we're going to take it in the shorts, although a lot of people don't believe it for the same reasons. Well, that can't possibly be blah, blah, blah. Just like people said in the 20s in Europe, oh, that ain't going to happen to us. Uh, so that's another thing. But I well, will it say, can't happen to us because we're Americans. Yeah, we kick ass. We always win. Yeah, yeah. All right. America, just like this guy we were talking about, Peters earlier. I mean, Peters. Uh, you know, we we're American culture. You know, we we understand digital technology and American culture. We're 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 putting it out all around the world. You know, they all want to be American. They, you know, they have no choice. We'll overwhelm them with our culture. Well, I don't think so. You know. No, we'll just go show up and go boo, and they're all for you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. No, they, no. They've seen those videos, man. No, I, no. I, um, we are being set up for an OK Corral in Eurasia, yeah. and oh, and yeah. and so and and going back to what I was saying is that I'm not even resorting to the scripture in this one because the futuristic writers I think tapped into the dark side, yeah, and gave us a wink and nod, and that's what we can expect. But that also states that nothing happens from invaders. And in this case, we could talk about it being a, a, Sino, uh, a Sino-Russia thing. 
it's not going to happen to the old world. Europe has been the controlling influence forever. Uh, mm-hmm. The fact that we laugh at kings and queens, uh, that's probably not a good idea because they just were willing to sit in the background, but they're waiting again to come just based on what you said also because they believe they're in the Merovingian line mm-hmm. uh, and have the divine right to rule. So and the Habsburgs w- were, you know, very much uh, classic. the driving force yes. behind the old Holy Roman Empire. They're still around. They're still oh, no, powerful. It, it, they're right. still extremely wealthy. No. And I think they're, you know, sitting there waiting for their, their turn. And that time is at hand. Mm-hmm. So my point is, uh, as far as I can see, Europe will not be very, I mean, it, they're not going to have a lot of problems. Uh, and then, of course, that force. Well, I think we're being pushed by what I would call the Fourth Reich, the Underground Reich, uh, I think we're being pushed by those forces into a situation where we are going to be pitted against the Russians. They've been of wanting course. to do that yeah. for 67 years now, and they're just about to the point where they're going to do it. All right. They, you know, they got rid of communism. Uh, you know, communism's gone. Stop. But Russia is still there. You know, no. I mean. Look, Russia is still a powerful entity, and the United States and Russia are going to be pitted against each other. Communism, in in the true adjective form, not the yeah. pro, uh, not the uh, proper noun. Uh, communism is Catholic. It is universal. Yeah. That is where we're going. The well, two it's feudalism, really. Well, yeah, and the two brands of it yeah. that are, were represented by the Soviet Union and or Russia, coal, whatever you want, yeah. and China is still very well there. That yep. is what is the is going to be the world we're going to. And the other, in the other, uh, fascism re- as represented by Italy and Germany, and in fascism light as it is in the United States, and it's going to be a little more fascism heavy. Uh, that uh, both of those systems. What's really the new world order is nothing more than a modern form of feudalism. It is a know? is a conjoining of everything that you've ever said. I mean, <clears throat> we, we split hairs once in a while. But my point is, when it all finally gets amalgamated, what we're looking at is one big fat fascism slash communism slash godlessness. I mean, right. that's it. Oligarchical collectivism. That's what. Uh, and he was right. And he was dead right. And yeah, that's what we've got, and that's where we're going to. And um, it is a, it is a basically the modern form of feudalism, which you can call oligarchical collectivism. Uh, I mean, that was a very erudite way of saying it, but. Feudalism works for me. Look, I mean, um, and I'm going to go into this tonight if I get a chance. I don't know. If not, I'll, I'll do it later. But the thing is this, and, and let's face it, human government is always a failed experiment. It just lasts a certain amount of time right. and something else happens. That's because humans are failed because exactly. humans have a fallen nature. There you go. And the thing is, no matter what they want to call it, and you said early out, democracy, I equate democracy, and I think I am textbook and both uh, in reality correct, I equate um, Democracy with fascism, because it's mob rule. Oh. Well, think of, I mean, democracy has been spoken of in such high platitudes, but when you go down the route... Democracy is, doesn't work. No, it doesn't. It just doesn't. It's I mean, a human really, thing, too. It, it, in its purest form, you know, it, it, you're right, it would be mob rule. I mean... Uh, they tried the, the idea. Of, actually, uh, the American government is supposed to be a republic, not a democracy. But we talk about democratic principles and democracy so it all, all gets the time. Bandied about, and, right. and the terminology really means nothing. You know. All right. Um, let me let me get to this last thing, and I want to address democracy. Uh, my, okay. my point is, and I, and I want to get your take on it. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I value what Charles said, and I mean, he makes a strong case for it. I'm, I just see, and I do give very heavy weight to the mortals who warned us because I believe they knew. Uh, And that is the Holy Roman Empire, the whole of Europe, will escape the scalding that's going to take place in World War III. However, in time, that power will move to Jerusalem to rule from that city. Exactly. And then Jesus is going to come down and take names and kick asses. That's always been their plan was to get back to Jerusalem. You know, to own because it. of their belief yeah. in what and who and what they are. That's the prize, is it not, Larry? Exactly. <laughs> That's it. That's the jewel. That's all they're going for. And, and, and uh, you know, they're going to rebuild the temple, and uh, no. that's where the, the Antichrist, uh, that bloodline, grail bloodline sucker, will come in and uh, 
uh, declare himself to be God. And uh, this will be called the abomination of desolation. Well, uh, you know, I mean, we have no problem with that. That's what um, the Bible says. Well, I mean, and we have people that aren't going to give that any credit, and that's fine. Sure. But, well, I, you know, I, I expect a lot of the things that, you know, that we've been talking about today, uh, you know, we're probably going to get some people saying, you, you guys are really off the deep end, you know, you're, you're, you're really whacked. What a with, surprise. With all these ideas. <laughs> but, uh, Tell you know, somebody I don't know. Keep laughing because, I mean, you know, wow. I'm talking about them. Just keep laughing and, 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 uh, and watch, watch as it, it all goes down. All right. And it, it's going to happen. I mean, I, I'm, I am totally convinced of that. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know exactly how it's going to go down, but I know there's going to be a third world war that's going to bring in world government. And, that, and that's – There's no doubt about it. You, one thing I'm yeah, sure of. Without – yeah. I mean – after World War One, League of Nations. Eh. After World War Two, United Nations. Okay. After World War Three, yeah, you got the whole deal, man. I well, mean, look at this country. You know, once the most prosperous nation on earth, now a country bereft of a of a manufacturing base. I mean, how long can that go on? As how long, long can we continue like that? As long as they want us to. And the only thing we have going for us at this point is a powerful military. I was thinking beer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I, football. And, and, and right now the AFL is playing. I mean, I'm sorry. There's no AFL. Okay, it's the AFC. You're, you you must be thinking of the AFL because you're talking to me. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm wearing my Oilers sweatshirt right now. You know. Are you? Are you really? That's more info than you needed, right? Dog. Uh, that hurts. Um, but. No, these these are telling. I mean, I, get back to seriousness. These yeah. are, these are telling times. But the thing I have to admit, and I, you know, I, you know, I'm sorry. I've come to the conclusion uh, that people can be, be manipulated any way they need to be. The thing is, can you keep any kind of clarity, regardless of? And this is very important. What might happen to yourself? Uh, there are people. I mean, when you know that if if you go a certain way, that something bad might happen to you, but. If you're dealing with that kind of world, mm -hmm. just as you said before, I mean, there are double crosses, and, I mean, there's no safe haven. So you might yeah. as well go with what you believe to be the best. Um, and that's a choice that a lot of people in America are going to make, and they're not – actually, they're not really quite equipped to make that. And, therefore, you're going to see a, a population act not unlike others, but when they're up against the wall and the state's got a flashlight under their nose – they're going to go ahead and just flip and, and do what they have to do. Yeah, well, most people will go into survival mode, you know, and they're, they'll... Uh, they'll snitch, it, they'll it's spy. It's instinctive, you know. And, and, I mean, Hitler was big on, on fear, you know, as a motivator, and, and using fear to, you know, in the form of terrorism. Has it never not worked? It, it always works, and he said that. You know, he was a keen observer of human nature, and an evil SOB to the max. Also, I believe that, you know, he was even more powerful because he was indwelled by no, a, a, a demonic you spirit. Got it. He is a classic case of Marlowe, uh, his Faustus, and the familiar spirit that had, was with him. Right. No right. doubt about it. Uh, and that's what they're all, you know, invested with, and that's what we're facing today. But I want to say one thing uh, um, as, as we get out of here, and we'll go back to uh, – um, your timeline or, you know, the continuum as we've called it, and that is this. I just want to ask you this. Just think about it, and I'll come back to it. I'm going to table it tonight. If I get a chance, I may not, yeah. but I want to because, to me, it's an aha moment for me, and that is this. Considering we are on the planet Earth, considering that our eternal spirit from the time we were born was housed in what we can call a decaying uh, body, Right. Right. My well, mine's really decaying. I don't... <laughs> oh, believe me, bro. Let me tell you. Oh, this is this is horrible. Oh man, you know, what? I see my son and he's visiting with me, and you know, he's pumping weights. You know, he he has a set of weights that he left with me, and and uh, you know, the guy's in great shape. You know, he eats right. You know, he looks great. And I'm thinking, you know, it's been an awful long time since I felt that good and looked that good. You know. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, the good thing is, is that your brain's intact enough to remember that you that that was the case. <laughs> um, I remember that. <laughs> I, 
but, you know, but, uh, but he, all right, here's where I'm going to go. This is my big aha. And I, I said this at the outset to a certain extent. I think it should be mentioned here. And I'm going to run with this. Uh, and that is, I, I'm telling you, I mean, think about this truly. Yeah. And everybody out there, just consider it. Just listen to it. There is no such thing as freedom in the human experience. Freedom is an abstract concept that has been emblazoned in our brains by whatever civilization we've lived in. Right. And that gives us either a desire to maintain it when we think we have it or get back to it when we think we've lost it. But what I'm saying is look back in time. There was never that wonderful halcyon time. It never existed. It's only in our brains. And you, Larry, and me, and all of us who think we got it and, and probably do have it, we still hang on to that. And I'm just coming to the conclusion now that it never existed, but it's important for us to think that it did at some point backward so that we want to get back to that time, but it's not there. Right. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not saying that this is like, you know, equal to, uh, you know, E equals MC squared or something like that, but well, it's you, pretty do, close though. I mean, but these, <laughs> but but are we not? Are we not? I mean, yeah. Check I it. mean, every culture in every uh, every you know every culture has a belief system in, in what is freedom. I would think. Uh, I know that in America, you know, we we have had the the concept that we are free. We are a free country. We are the leader of the free world. Pounded into our heads from the time we were kids. Well, how free are you? You're not. You know, I mean, you know, you're you're in a certain amount of economic bondage. You know, unless you're independently wealthy, and even if you're independently wealthy, you still got, uh, you know, you you still the state will still try to tax you. You know, the, I mean, you can't be just totally, you know, independent. But let's economically. Let's let's acknowledge the fact that you and I, our parents. Let's talk about, you know, the 225 years or so of this uh, country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can say, for the most part, you know, we've been okay. However, we know that there's been, other, you know, millions crushed under the system. We've never been in actual bondage in the, sack that we ha in the fact that we have uh, irons around us. Yeah. So we've had it much better, although that, I, I believe that that day is coming to an end. But my point is is that that really isn't freedom because your freedom is only dictated by the lack of constraints that are upon you. Mm -hmm. In other words, they, let, quote, they let you have it, but it really doesn't exist. You just are better off than someone else. So in the end, what I'm saying is there is no such thing as freedom on a sin-cursed earth under Satan's power. Exactly. But here's the good point. For the moment, like we said, you were born. Uh, your spirit is eternal. Your spirit was housed in a body that can't last all that long. Some, you know, obviously housings, you know, last uh, less than others. But no matter what, you know, you're enslaved by your body. And I think we've talked about this, too, and some others have emailed, really pointed an email saying, you know, you're right. You know, you look at the world through this pair of eyes, just like you do, and we... we we remember stuff, and we, we, we are as young as we ever were in our heads. But then go to try to do something, you realize, oh, crap. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You are. Well, it's like Rodney Dangerfield said when he dies, he was going to wheel his body to uh, science fiction. <laughs> um, best move ever. It's, it's true. So my point is that freedom and liberty never exist on Earth. They can't. They're concepts yeah. that we are allowed to ingrained in our psyches and minds, but they really don't exist. There are some forms that are worse than others. Like I said, you know, we were never slavers and all that, you know, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. the point is, it never did exist. And we're trying to get back to a moment, a period of time that, in fact, never well, existed. It's kind of the, the, the concept of uh, the, the two philosophical concepts of free will versus determinism. I mean, what you're saying uh, from from the rap that, that you're giving me there, okay. is that to some extent everything is determined. Uh, you can make choices, but uh, you don't have, they're not totally of your own volition because there are consequences 
that are involved that would force you to make certain choices and that you don't have total free will. Um, well, how it, about you? Th here's my point. Now, you just hit it. The thing is, we think we have total free will. That's right. the canard. No, you really don't. There's, uh, I, I've had long arguments with, with people about you know the, that, the concept of determinism versus free will. Right. No philosophical argument, but, uh, you know, they're just, I mean, I can, uh, I can only do certain things within certain parameters just, just based on my physical body. All right. You know? But let, let me ask you this, because this is where I believe everything meets. I, you know, I mean, I, okay. Here's the point. We understand election. That's a hard thing to sell to people. Is it yeah. not? Okay. But here's what I think happens. There's a duality here. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and I'm not making excuses. I believe it's true. The Lord knows all. The Lord knows exactly what you're going to do. Okay? Does he not? Exactly, yeah. All right. He knows exactly what's going to happen. But, but he you, doesn't force you to do things how, one way or the other. He allows you to have free will. Well, here's the thing. He stands back, but he understands all that will happen. Right. We don't. So right. we think we have free will in the sense we do to make the choice or not. Where I think the problem comes is that the Lord understands there are some, well, let's put it this way. Everything is predestined, but we don't know it. That's the point. Yeah. He understands it. He knows it, but we don't. So we get to work out whatever we have to. And I know that's a really hard doctrine for a lot of people bite on. I mean, I understand that too, but I think where it's fair is we play out our lives as he allows us to do so, but he understands as the grand chess master what happens in the end then I understand that it is true that there is election and predestination. However, right. he allows us, or we are veiled from knowing what choices we're going to make. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that's, that's sticky water there and all that stuff, but the thing is we work our, our salvation out or we don't with fear and trembling. He knows all, so that's why he can say, you were elected, but we don't know we're elected. We don't have yeah. that influence. And therefore, we're allowed, if you will, to work it out ourselves. Some come, most don't. That's that's tough, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's something I think about a lot. Uh, you know, what is freedom? You know, it's just basic philosophy. You know, what is know. God? What is the nature of God? You know, what are you know, what uh, what really is behind all of uh, all of it of uh, you know human existence? I'm, These are big concepts for me. <laughs> it is, but you know what? It is for very big concepts. It is for all of us. But the, find, the way I find that it works is that we are allowed to go about our business. Right. He is a creator who is also able to avail himself from things at certain times, which I think, you know, Paul kind of chides me for this, Sanhu, but I believe in Jeremiah when the Lord says, never did it enter my mind that you would do this. That's the Lord speaking. He knows everything, but I but we can't fathom, you know, somebody who made us. We can't get into that brain, and so if somebody knows something, without no, all right, if we you know how where that's going to go, okay? Yeah. It's like he allows himself not to know, but he knows all. Uh, yeah. we, we can't even go there. But for us, what, what my point is, well, I mean, knowing the mind of God is impossible. It's impossible. And and the thing, the one concept that always blows me away. And I, if I sit and think about it very long, you know, I, I just get completely uh, confused. Or, who, who am I? Don't I? Know what the term would be, but but uh, it's the idea that God is eternal, that God has always existed Before, and always right, will exist. And people say, well, that's ridiculous. There could be no entity like that. Well, I know. these are the same people that believe the universe has always existed and always will. You know, and how I'm many saying, well. There has to be a cause and effect. What what caused the universe? Let me ask you this. When you were in elementary school, and I mean this because this is when I had some of these uh, moments. I just remember them as being those moments. And I'll tell you, one was at first grade. Mm -hmm. I, I For whatever reason, in my daydreams in the classroom or whatever, I try to figure out who started this all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Life. <laughs> um, and, you know, who am I? And uh, 
how do I know that he's really there or whatever? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I remember doing that, and it, it is absolutely maddening. And to this day, sometimes I look at him going, well, and of course, you know, agnostics and atheists or whatever they are would say, well, how can you, I mean, they feel you have to rationalize everything. And yeah. I understand that. That would make sense if it were accounting, you know, business and stuff like that. But we're not talking about that. Um, but it is, a, it is an impossible concept to embrace. Mm -hmm. What did he create and what would their quote, what would have been if he weren't here? It's impossible. Isn't it? I mean, it's just impossible. Right. And I think about that stuff. I mean, I think it's kind of important in a sense because we all have our doubts and such. But in the end, you know, especially because, you know, I've gotten back in the word and I'm reading it, although it may not show. But I, I'm, st you know, I mean, I just need to be sat down and talked to, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And I believe it's important for everybody because we're coming to a moment which I can't think, I mean, inarguably, no matter how you feel, we're coming to a certain kind of cataclysm. Yeah. Which leads me to a question that I've been wanting to ask that's uh, apropos. Have you spoken to uh, Kathleen? Uh, yeah, I have. How are things going with her? Uh, apparently okay. And thank you for asking. And, uh, and she'll appreciate that. And I'll email her. I really love Kathleen. She's a, a good Christian sister. I really do. Um, neither you nor I have the balls that she had to go where she went. That is a woman with great courage. And, you know, that <laughs> comes from faith. That comes from being yep. uh, – some people stand in better with the Lord than others, if you understand what I mean. Uh, she has been the gift of great belief and courage. Uh, and let's put it this way, the understanding that um, you may not make it back, but – for what cause would be better to sacrifice one's life? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, she did it. We think about it. She did it. So anyway, I don't know how deep she got into whether she went to Pakistan or not. I kind of think she did. But she told me, uh, and again, like I said, thank you for asking. Uh, on January 21st, we're, I think, supposed to talk, uh, doing an interview with her in Europe on cool. her way back. Uh, and that is if everything goes okay. Um but, yeah, uh, we uh, pale <laughs> in her uh, efforts um, because she is sold out to Jesus Christ without a doubt. And, I mean, you know, the, the spiritual muscle she has uh, makes us look like the 58-pound uh, weakling on the beach. <laughs> yeah. Let's call it what it is. She, she's there. We're not. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, she's supposed to tap in. I said to her, you know, I don't Skype. I said, you know, I really don't want to do that. But I do have a calling card, I said, which I just, you know, checked, and it's very active, and, that, and I use this for uh, mainly for foreign interviews, of which I do not do any anymore. And she said she'll be back in the room <laughs> <laughs> on uh, January 21st, and I said, yeah, let's get that done. So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. All roads lead to Rome. <laughs> uh, it's funny how that works out that way, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. It really well, does, I mean, you know, in more than one way, not just in physical no, uh, but in the gra the grand scope of things, it does. There's a symmetry. It really does. I, you can, uh, you know, people can say what they want, but I mean, the influence of Rome uh, on the history of the world is is just enormous, and and it, it still is today. Um, and lastly, um, you know, thanks for coming on and obliging me because I like to do stuff during the diurnal day, and I, yeah, I, I appreciate you. that. Uh, I, I do. Um, but Ronald Lee Claxton, I think, is on to something very important, mm -hmm. and um, he writes me he writes me all the time, and he is constantly, you know, and I believe truthfully so, mm -hmm. like you know, look, I, I'm I'm hitting stuff that I'm not really comfortable with, but I'm not doing this to become some kind of sensational something or other. He goes, I'm just finding this stuff out. Can I can I share it? And I'm like, yeah. And I mean, you know, to me in this case. I let a Twyman come on. I let a Twyman come on. Do I care about it? Absolutely not. But for a gentleman like this and other people who come this way, it's like, no, no, I know your heart, and it's all right. Let's talk this thing over. And that's what I said to him. Don't worry about it. Put the stuff out. You, you know, you're broken to the Christ. I understand it. Just share it. If I thought you were wacky ding hoy, you wouldn't be around. Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of, a lot of times uh, when you – I think what's important on the show, and it seems to be coming to, together now, uh, is that you have people that have niches. 
you know, people that yeah, have a, area. a little, that's right. Yeah. And mine is, you know, the whole Nazi thing. And then of course you've got Andy Colvin, you know, he's, he's got his thing. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess in in one way, Kathleen has a, sure. has a uh, yeah as a part and of the it, puzzle. And now, and now this yeah. this fellow Claxton. Uh, and I'll tell you, if you haven't listened, and it's okay if you haven't, but I would ask you to do no, so. No, I did listen. I I, I enjoyed it. <sighs> um, and I've, I've got never any, heard anything quite like it. Um, you know what? I uh, here's what I here's what I feel is happening here. He's somebody who's following something he thinks he should, mm. and when he hits it, it's like, oh no, oh yeah. no, 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 no. And that's and you know and and I can deal with that because that's the way I would be. It's like oh I don't want this to be true, and although he's allowing stuff for error, it's okay. And I just said, look, we'll deal with it. You know, we'll deal with it. Just come out with it because, to me, and what he said was interesting. Also, he said, in a way, he said, and of course, he's not known me through all these years, but he said what I found pulls together what the informer is talking about, what Montgomery has been talking about, what John Ackerman is talking about. Mm. And it all seems, just like you said, and maybe we can agree on this, that there may be a point now where there's going to be a convergence. And it's like some folks are going to go that way and some folks are going to go that way. And perhaps some of these individuals are being used for such to say, yes, all we've known and what the Bible says is true. Well, I know with uh, <clears throat> with Kathleen, uh, some of my my babblings, you know, I, I'm making, I'm doing the best I can, and, you know, and some of it apparently struck a chord with her, and I'm glad it did, you know, yeah. and she wanted to come on and talk about it, and and I think that, uh, you know, when you hear something that that another individual is coming up with and saying, I think it's like this, and this is what I see, and this is my research. And they go, well, yeah, that's right. I, you know, I see that myself, and and we're all kind of uh, struggling to to get more information, and to put more information out there to to others of like mind. And I believe, and in, and in, uh, in, I'm I'm sure at some point in time that I, I know that the Lord wants us to do this. I really do. I mean, I, you know, I don't. I, I wouldn't be doing it otherwise, okay. and, and I don't yeah. really think you would anymore. No. I mean, there was a time when you were probably into being a radio host, you know, and having a show uh, for entertainment, you know, as a, as a profession. But now it's more you're doing it because you do what you want to do on the show, and and you reach the audience that you want to reach. I, I'll agree to that. Yeah. No, I, I stand. You know, I stand corrected and convicted without a doubt. Yeah. Um, and I think, though, that for those who have ears to hear, eyes to see, um, that there is a convergence here, without a doubt. I think what, what, what uh, Ronnie Lee is talking about uh, is, is very accurate. And I, I, I see him as somebody just like ourselves. who are like, oh, man, I stumbled upon this stuff. I, sometimes I wish I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And we're going to work that out. But, but the time is at hand. There's no two ways about it. And you're right. I mean, um, yeah, I, there was a time during the Beyond the Grassy you Knoll know, days to which we both refer where, you know, I was like, you know, an entertainment jukebox, like, you know, Dick Clark, here's the thing. Yeah. And I hated it, and I burnt it, um, and, you know, and rightfully so. And now, now there's no two ways about it. It's like, look, you know it and I know it. One percent of one percent are going to understand, are going to mm -hmm. believe, and that's it. That's all there's going to be. You go ahead and you broadcast and, you, you know, you do whatever you can. You scatter shot whatever you got. Right. But in the end, it's always the smallest, but that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you're supposed to. Right. And and and, and, and so that's it. You're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, you well, were there through Gordon all stuff. Has, Gordon has a niche. You know, he, yep. he goes out and finds these old books that have been memory hold. You know, I, I, I listened to the last broadcast. That was very interesting to me. You know uh, the things he had found out about Tammany Hall, yeah. and, and that was a very interesting show, and it was apropos. You know, yeah, and it, it has meaning today. It's not just you know some old boring history. You know, it was nope. a, a very good, and there's a reason why that book got memory hold. You know, because it told the truth about the American political process by a guy who was a, a muckraker, you know, investigative journalist of yep. his day. The same thing with Seldes. He went out. Yep. You know, he asked me about Seldes. I didn't know how to really obtain, you know, uh, any of Selby's work. But Gordon went out and just pursued it and bulldogged it until he got a copy of uh, yep. one of the books that 
uh, I can't remember which one it was now, but it was one that was basically out of print. It took him a while, but he got it. And, and I mean, and he makes good use of those things. You know, and Andy Senior also brought us stuff about um, Albert Knock. Oh, I love that guy. Andy Senior is great. He's he's so funny. He's uh, just a great guy. No, I, I tell you what. Um, yeah, I I think the greatest antidote is humor. Exactly. Uh, and um, and he has an incisive size side, yeah. and I mean he's the one that turned us on to Albert Knock, who's another one that was saying the Constitution guys. I mean, come on, give me a break, you know. <laughs> Uh, and so Andy pulled that gem out, and that's what people do, you know, and that's what we're trying to present. Right. Um, it, it, it's not pretty, but it is the way it is. If that's interesting, if, if that is interesting and important to you, understand what's going on, that you can't change it uh, terrestrially or in the flesh. Uh, yeah, that's probably true, but this ain't the end of the line for all our spirits. And that's where I was going with before, and that is, you know, when our spirits were, however that happens through conception, were enclosed by a body, we were enslavement to a certain degree. It's kind of cool for some, you know, for a lot of people, but for some, and you know, I mean, illness happens, uh, lives are cut short, so, you know, and, but the point is, there is no true freedom, but there will be after this time, and that's where it's going to make all the difference. You know, people either buy into that or they don't, um, but I am. And, I mean, I got myself scared straight probably a couple of years ago, which you were probably on hand to watch. Mm. And I said to myself, you know, that was my first love, and I've, I've turned away from it. And, uh, you know, I got a, a come to Jesus meeting, and I'm like, yeah, all right. And so now, you know, that's where we're at. These are interesting times, but now they're being very accelerated, and they'll not be much hidden much longer. But the point is, you get you, if you get entrapped, uh, you probably not be able to extricate yourself, and you probably won't. I don't know what that means necessarily, except that you're not going to find a solution any longer in humanity. It's not going to happen. Sorry, but it's just not going to. No, no, that's that's the whole point. Is uh, you know the, the the greatest lie ever told by Satan was that we could be as gods. He told that to Eve in the you know in the garden. That was you know uh, that we we could be gods, and we can't. We're not God. We're not ever no, going we're not. to be God. Right. You know, we're spiritual beings, and God is our Father. You know, and uh, once you know they they had the knowledge of good and evil, you know, uh, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Game set match. Yeah. Um, and I'll say one other thing too, in deference to those who were younger, um, some who like we were in twenties talk too much and listen too little, who uh, get too smart too late and too old too soon. And that is the, that is the whole progression of life, but you know, you and myself um, and others of our uh, age cohort, mm. I'll have to say this: there's a dual, well, there's a double-edged blessing going on here. And I'll be honest with you: you know, and I know that as e these years go by, the main thing is is that, you know, are we going to get sick? Are we going to have cancer? Are we going to have to deal with this? And so that when you're dealing with fatality. The New World Order doesn't mean jack crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for us, the old bohemians, um, you know, we can kind of give up stuff because we know either way it's over with. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, for those who are younger, I try not to necessarily temper what we have to say. So, well, they see themselves as having a lot more to lose. You well, know? They, but don't they? I mean, in a sense, they and do. And they do, yeah. 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 But you and I are, you know, coming into to the latter part of our lives, you know. Uh, yeah, we played all the bingo we yeah. wanted to. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're in, a, we're in a home stretch now. And it's like, uh, well, you know, that worked, this didn't work, that was cool, that wasn't cool. You know, you see all these things in retrospect, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, they, they still want to experience, uh, you know, the fullness of life. And I can't say I blame them. That's, you know, life's for living and, you know, for learning and et cetera, et cetera. But, um there comes a point to which you begin to sort out what's really important. And, you know, your relationship with God is the most important thing. Your family is next, you know. And uh, there's a certain list of priorities, but those are the two most important ones. You know, I, I mean, there's no question to me that God, our, my relationship with God is the most important thing in life. But my family's got to come next. I mean, I can't see anything more important than that. And uh, there are a lot of people that just haven't come down to that, you know, where they're still... 
I, I know when it, it's it's just one of those things for especially for young men, you know, to be self absorbed, you know, and and hedonistic, and uh, that's just not the way to live. I I never was. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what well, kind of those emails this week with joking you know about what? those things in those times? I tell and you what, coyote um, ugly and oh. <laughs> yes. Ooh, yes, uh, anybody who's keeping a notebook, oh, that'll be great. <laughs> but, but I'll be honest with you, and I'll end on this, and I'm going to let you have the, you know, the last salvo, and we'll get together next week, you know, Lord will, yeah. and I think he'll, he will will that. <laughs> but um, there was a time, um, the, 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 the tale of, of Faust always interested me because it was this deal with him and the devil, you know, depending on what you get from Marlowe or, Fa- or uh, Goethe, mm-hmm. whatever, and that was... If you if you given everything, you know, um, if you reach a time, and I think I have this straight, where you don't want to go further, Satan will grab your soul. But but the character um, Faust or Faustus said, if you give me, you know, complete run, I'll never find a time I want to last. Uh, I'll tell you this, and I'm not proud of it, but in 1975, I actually stood before a mirror in my my bedroom um whatever i was or i wasn't fine but i mean i had like furrowed all my semesters i was just because i was such an idiot in the first two years i got magna cum laude i had a 35 game hitting streak i had everything i wanted and no shortage of females and i looked in the mirror and i remember this precisely i looked in the mirror and i said this is not right this is not the way it's supposed to be. There was something missing. There was something that was essential that was missing, and and I guess we've all experienced that one way or the other. All right. You know, and, I say all of us. I'm talking about Christians. No, and, and I, I think back to the tales of Faust and Faustus, and I understand it that there was there was a deal being brokered before me mm-hmm. that would give me exactly what I wanted. And if I want to go down that road, I would have had every hedonistic thing I wanted. But for a certain time, let's remember, there's always yeah. a, there's always a betrayal at the end. Yeah. But I remember say, looking in the mirror and going, no, this is not right. This is not right. And I remember saying that the more that I grab for the stimuli, right, whether it's sex or whatever it was, the more I grab for it, the less it meant, and the more it made me want to grab for more. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I was losing per incident, if you will, which is a horrible way to put it, uh, the bang. Which yeah. is another one. And I just said... But you know what? I mean, it took me another five years until I got put back on my rear end, and Jehovah looked at me and said, Do, can we talk now? And I'm really thankful that he sat me down in that stinking, rotten gas station in the middle of <laughs> Pennsylvania yeah. on a horrible night. And I'm like, thank you. I'm lucky, I guess. I, you, you know, we don't want to talk about luck, but, I'm, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, I mean... Well, God loves all of us, and, yeah. you know, he has a plan for our lives. I, you know, I believe that. I, I think the Bible shows that. The, the problem is so often that uh, we are so not headed that uh, it takes an awful long time before we get it, and we start uh, trying to live that life in that plan that, that God has for us. You know, Neil Young sang, Russ Never Sleeps. And if you can get outside just the lyrics of that, think about that. Yeah. Because everything in nature erodes. Everything breaks down. Right. Whatever is good gets corrupted. I mean, if you had a cable package in 1990, probably it sucks more and costs you more now. Oh, yeah. I mean, but, you know, I know this is tripe, but you know what I'm saying? It's that whatever is, from the moment that it is, starts to become well, it's just like when you buy a new car. You know, if you keep it for several years, you see it deteriorate. It just is. But that's the way of the and, world. And you try your best. I mean, most young guys especially would try their best to keep it clean and keep it waxed up and keep it looking good and running good. But, I mean, the, the eventually the engine breaks down. You know, the, the paint job starts to deteriorate everything. You know, the interior gets a little funky. And, you know, it's just one of those things. I have a, a pickup now that's 11 years old with 110 on it. Yeah. And and uh, the two unfortunates that were in that truck were Jeff Long and Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> and both of them just laughed their asses off as we went flying down 
country <laughs> dirt roads with, uh, excuse me, long necks between our legs uh, because there are no traffic lights on dirt roads. And the thing is, is that I got that little heap out there. If I were to wash it now, that truck would come apart because it's, all, you know what I mean? And it's like, folks, that's the way it is, you know. Oh, man. But, that, but but the thing is that everything moves toward erosion from the moment that it be, is yeah. begotten. That's yeah. just I mean that's universe. That's that's physics. That's okay. It's entropy. We oh, understand. Just, it. You know, it's like that old song. You know, why am I dying to live when I'm just living to die? You know, <laughs> and uh, you know it's a little more pessimistic than I want to be. I mean, being a Christian, but it, it, it there is a good point behind that. Well, if it, if it helps anybody in the Northeast, Springs has said the same thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's it, but it's a factor of life. I mean, that's the way it goes. Nothing can stay pristine. It just does not happen. And that's when I started to say, you know, there was no such thing as freedom. That we always think about it as a time when back then, and it's like, well, there was no back then because back yeah. then sucked too. It's just that. Well, it's like you're saying, though. You know, uh, I kind of do it as well as yourself and go retreat around the holidays and kind of live in your, you know, your little cocoon of, you know, happy, happy, happy Memories. ever after That's right. and, That's and leave it to Beaverland, you know. But I do it, too, because it, it it's comfortable for me to do that, and I, and I need a little bit of a rest, you know, a vacation into that leave it to Beaver world, you know. Um, I will admit that, and people will say to me, well, aren't you the biggest um, uh, principal of going back in time and thinking that was, and I admit it. And when I, when I did that audio just recently, the Not Quite Perfect Christmas, I said at the end, you know, I remember it better than it should be, but you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. Exactly. However, I understand the reality of it. It is just a place, it's a cotton bed, where I lay for a while just to do it, and I yeah. get back up and say, okay, here's life again. And I understand it, and that's all that it is. There's times when people just need to rest, you know, psychologically, uh, or even sometimes physically, you need to rest, you know. Sure. Yeah. And uh, to kind of renew yourself. Uh, every time that you know that happens, it seems, uh, you know, I've observed in you, uh, you know, you're recharged, you're ready to go. You know, you seem happier and and more energy, and that's good, man. What's wrong with that? I mean, everybody needs that. Um, I'm going to mention this is going to be a shout out to. And we'll call it a day. And, again, uh, thanks for coming on and shifting the schedule. I no really problem. appreciate it. No problem. I, I'm enjoying it. Uh, and so am I. Believe me. Otherwise, uh, you know, I mean, I want to hang on to this for as long as we can. Um, but um, uh, Gene from Crickland. <laughs> and I, this, is, this is sweet. This is cool. And yeah. this is probably the last uh, holiday thing. Here's the, here's the other thing. There's a guy with some energy. Gene uh, comes on. He's talking fast. I'll he's tell you what. He's doing New York um, thing. <laughs> he has he has written as well as Kira. I mean, the two of them um, are like they they complement one another, though they're you know millennia apart and light years away and all that. And one's in Pitts, uh, Pennsylvania, and one's in uh, uh, Brooklyn, but they both bring something to the table. But I tell you, lately um, Eugene um, has really sent some stuff along that's that's it's it's quite revelatory. And he is a, he's a very big defender of um, the informer at a time now where you don't really know this is going on. And maybe you do to a certain extent, but, you know, these little jackals now are yipping at his feet like he's a bo- you know, he's bogus. It, it just, it's horrible. But then again, yeah. whatever you have that's good will eventually somebody will go after it. Yeah. But anyway, what he did was um, <clears throat> my father and his two first cousins, which really were his brothers in his upbringing, um, always went to a – wonderful Italian seafood place in Sheepshead Bay. And man, I wish I was there. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I Italian food. let me tell you, this is out of the Godfather. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, this yeah. is the best. Um, and anyway, uh, that ended in time, obviously, all three, well, two of the three are the deceased, and one is, you know, in his 90s. But yeah. I, I, I had mentioned it, and, and Eugene went ahead and found the place, and took photos of it. And the neat thing about this is he sent duplicates to me. And my sister, who's eight years older than I, and probably and obviously had a, a longer relationship with my dad. Yeah. And our first cousin, who was the daughter of one of the three who has passed away, not the daughter, but the, the dad, I get to send them along. And that's like what the whole holiday thing is about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's what I've always said. It's like counting the empty chairs and, and seeing everybody who have to recede in the mist once, you know, Christmas Eve is uh, Christmas Day is over. And so I just want to say that, you know, you're right. And, 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 and I, I like it like that. And I appreciate that Gene set that stuff along because that goes on to, you know, not only my sister and her husband, but, you know, our cousin and stuff. And that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, he stepped up and did that. And I'm like, holy mackerel, you know, it's going to, um, it's going to bring some tears and some smiles, you know, to, uh, to my cousin and both my sister. And, and really, in the end, I mean, you know, that's all it's about. It really is all that it's about. We have to deal with everything, but there's nothing stopping us from times to going back and tapping um, our supposed little, like you said, leave it to beaver days. Um, that, to me, is a pretty healthy uh, strategy, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that we don't need psychologists for or, uh, you know, Prozac or any of that crap. Yeah, it's a good place to recharge your batteries and say, okay, even if it was really that way, we're going to just agree that it was. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I can create that little world in my mind. And uh, I felt really comfortable over the holidays, you know, with my mom and staying, spent a lot of time with her and, uh, of course, my sister yeah. and the rest yep. of my family. And, and we all got together a couple of times here and there. And, and uh, it, it was just really good, you know, and uh, really comfortable for me. And, uh, you know, because I, I fit in. I know – Everybody and I accept them. They love me. They know they know my faults and vice versa, you know. But they still love me and care about me. And it, it was uh, it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot. Uh, we all need it. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, uh, I guess it only happens for, you know once a year. Uh, and and like I told you, I mean, I have constructed this thing. I only did it a couple of years ago, you know. But right. don't talk to me, in, you know, from Thanksgiving until New Year's. Day. I don't have a problem with it. I get it. Uh, yeah. you know, I get it totally. Yeah, I, I did kind of the same thing, only maybe a little bit longer than yourself. Okay, there you go. Oh, and uh, I won't say this tonight because I, I probably won't get it on the on the uh, on the air. Yeah. And anybody who's like lasted through this whole audio that we've just done, I think that this is worth uh, telling you. Okay. Now, on New Year's Eve, we had our venison instead of gator pizza, right? Yeah. Well, that stuff backed up my hole. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in bed with Lady Viz, and she's, like, cutting Z's, and I'm like, rrp. And, I mean, it was, it, it was bad. I mean, it was, you know, the furnace was coming up through the uh, ducts. <laughs> now, here's what happened. We had, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm so, I was so looking forward to that. I have no idea why that happened. But here's where we go. Um, we have a neighbor who has watched my back, um, a single woman, you know, 60-something or whatever, and just a really good neighbor. Uh, you know, when Dumbhead comes in and forgets to put his lights out on his truck, she comes over and says, your lights are on. And, you know, so anyway, what we did was we uh, gifted her with this box of, like, uh, anyway, with, with, with um, uh, you guys aren't probably familiar with this, but uh, we have kumquat trees here in Florida. Uh -huh. And we made they make a jams out of it and, and barbecue sauce. Oh, it's the best. And and a former coworker of mine works in that uh, company. She's actually family. So anyway, here's what happens. I can't sleep. It's Christmas Eve. I now say, you know, the heck with this. I know my neighbor gets up at 5 a.m. in the morning. So now it's like 4 o'clock. And we, you know, Lady Viz made this box and, and put a bow on it and all this stuff and a card. And I figured, why not deliver it to our neighbor's door? So when Christmas Day comes, she opens it up, and bang, there it is. Mm -hmm. So I take it, and I walk out. I put it on their stoop, and I think I'm hearing something. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm like, okay, you know what this is about? And, and uh, I'm being serious as a heart attack. I am not exaggerating. So I'm like, okay, you know, what is this? And, you know, where we are, I mean, this, who could be out there? Yeah. I walk outside looking to see if there's some kids that I have to punch upside the head, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I kid you not, across the road before my eyes went two deer. Yeah. Scuttling along. And the first thing that, just dig this, it's Christmas Eve. The first thing in my mind was, where's the sled? <laughs> it was beautiful. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and I just watched those, you know, those beautiful beings who try to live or, and do so successfully in this, you know, ever-expanding megalopolis. Yeah. And for that time, I'm like, wow, 
that is cool. But I had to laugh because I'm like, I saw him going, oh, please don't let there be another another five in a, in a slide. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to explain this. <laughs> and that was just the best. Anyway, so that's how, despite my, uh, you know, my furnace belching and stuff like that, that's how my uh, Christmas Eve ended and my Christmas Day started. And I'll never forget that because it was like for a moment I'm like, oh, man, don't tell me this is real. <laughs> And my neighbor still doesn't know we gave her the stuff. So anyway, <laughs> um, get lost. Okay. <laughs> uh, you've got you've got a uh, we've got football games to watch. Yeah. And ask to kick before this night is over. Yeah. Uh, once again, thank you. And, sure. No uh, problem. I'm just thinking if we go through like 2012, you'll be up to like part 80. <laughs> I'm gonna die before you're done. <laughs> All right. Oh man, I don't know. Just keeps going, I guess. Yeah, think about that, will you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and as always, Eeyore, I appreciate. <laughs> oh I, man, I, I appreciate you being here, and apparently so do others. So, you know, even if it's only the madness between the two of us, yeah. there's actually people out there who are tapping into it. And I'm yeah, thinking, I, got, that, I, I really enjoyed getting that email. Uh, or it was nice. Well, emails, yeah, it was some several. Yeah, they liked it. And uh, it was really cool. The guy was uh, sending, uh, I guess it's a guy, uh, sent an email saying that, uh, that Confirming. They, they ran into uh, a PDF of Otto Strasser's book, Hitler and I, and that Strasser uh, verified that Bernard Stample, the Jesuit priest, actually wrote Mein Kampf. That's the fourth source that I've found that says that. All right. That's key. So you have four f- sources that said Adolf uh, probably didn't do it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, he had input, obviously. You know, he you know, I'm sure the Stra- uh, or Stample would talk to him, interview him about things. But Stample put it together. Uh, yeah, and I mean, obviously, if he was going to be the mouthpiece for it, no, he was, he was, you know, he was drilled. He knew what yeah, was going on. Well, here, tell me what happened yeah. here in, in uh, Vienna. Tell me what happened in Munich, you know, and I'll put this book together. Yeah, and a shout-out to Kelly for sitting in along, uh, for yeah. having you back. That was cool. Yeah. All right, um, I'll talk. <laughs> I'm having heartburn right now. <laughs> uh, I'll talk to you next week. Okay. All right, we'll God you bless later. you. Yeah, right. I, I appreciate it, and we'll work it out. Okay, no problem, man. All right, see you later. Yeah. Go Texans. <laughs> Bye. Don't hang up. <laughs> you hung up. <laughs>